Hey, hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Um, super excited. I'm Carrie Sandra of Alpenglow Industries, and this is Mark Smith of uh, Mark Smith Industries. Well, halibut, en <laughs> halibut Engineering is the Ooh, name I'm using. Halibut yeah. Engineering, your official name. Excellent. I love well, it. Kind it's of not official. official. Don't tell the city, city yet. I haven't told oh, them yet, but we I'm working on it. Secret. I've had halibut.com since 1995, so I think I'm good. I kind of love that. I love that all of the halibut fishers are really irked yes. about you having halibut.com and not using it for anything that is actual halibut fish related. fishing related. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I keep getting offers from various different deep, deep sea fishing uh, venture companies or like Alaskan tour companies or whatever. The, <laughs> the biggest offer I've gotten so far is $25,000. And I'm like, nope. Ooh. Nope. Ooh. I've been halibut for way too long. <laughs> That's not enough to get me to rebrand. You can kiss my halibut. That's oh, right. Whoa! what? <laughs> I haven't even had that much beer yet. I have no excuses. This is a strange beer, too, I will say. Um, it is, strange. it's very strange. It's Cali, Cali Common Hybrid Lager. So it's like a lager, but it's brown. So it just, it's confusing my taste buds, I will say. <laughs> All right, then. I am, however, uh, drinking nice, clear still water <laughs> from a Mr. Snarls, Mr. Yes, Snarls Mr. glass. Mr. Snarls glass. Yeah, that's right. Oh, cool. Hello, Jeff. And hello, Brent. And hello, Vince. Nice. Oh, Vince. Nice V6LK. Okay. He's, uh, oh, and uh, Brent Hauser, yeah. KD0GLS. Yeah, yeah. Brent is And Jeff Glass. I know a, Jeff Glass. Is a, Jeff glass. Okay. Is a longtime viewer. Brent did the Mystifier, which is out in the display area now. Oh, very cool. Yes. Very cool. Yes. Uh, Vince is on the podcast that I also do. Oh, yep. cool, cool. Ham Radio Workbench. Nice. There will be many plugs for the Ham Radio Workbench today. Yay. Yay. Plugs, 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 all good. Well, maybe we should start talking about Ham Radio okay. then. Um, so I know pretty much nothing all about right. Ham Radio. Yeah. And so I have like so many questions right. about it. Um, so first of all, like, tell us about how you got into ham radio. That is an interesting one. Uh, my, and I guess maybe, and maybe we should actually back up and like brief overview of what, of ham, what, radio. It, what ham radio is. Yeah. So amateur radio. So ham is a, it's not, it's not a derogatory term, but it, it is an unofficial term. The, the proper term. Oh, if we're mm, going to be yes. proper. I can stick your pinky up. Oh, hang on. Hang I, on. I'll, I'll drink my tea because I'm, you know, double fisting with tea and beer because that's how you do it. I mean, uppers and downers. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> how you keep amateur balanced. radio is a way for non-commercial entities, individuals, people like me, uh, to be able to experiment with radio. And mm -hmm. uh, there are a bajillion and a half mm -hmm. different things you can do in ham radio. So when people say, what do you do with ham radio? One of our favorite, uh, favorite phrases is that it is a hobby of a thousand hobbies. Mm -hmm. Um, because there are so many different things that you can do with it. Uh, anything from uh, like short range, and by short range, I mean uh, miles to tens of miles mm -hmm. uh, to hundreds of miles in the absolute best case, uh, like short range handheld. Like if you think of an FRS radio, like you see kids running around the neighborhood with yeah. like that, but on steroids yeah. um, to kind of the longer range communications. Uh, that, that would be the, the shorter range stuff would be VHF or UHF for my ham listeners here. Yes. Um, uh, to the longer range stuff, mm -hmm. which is the lower frequencies, ironically called high frequency HF, <laughs> yeah, uh, as opposed it's to like very high, high frequency or extreme, high, super high frequency, yeah, high. yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the HF range uh, are longer wavelengths and uh, bigger antennas, uh, lower frequencies, and they are the kinds of waves that can bounce around the world, literally. Yeah. Um, so it, it goes up. They, it can like bounce off the, off the atmosphere yeah. and then like- And come back so down can, again thousands of miles away. Yeah, which yeah. is super cool because then you like actually can talk to people who are outside of line of sight of the Correct. antennas, which is like, Correct. what? Yeah, so the no. VHF, UHF stuff is mostly line of sight. There's mm -hmm. asterisks there because there are asterisks on all of this. There are exceptions to everything I'm about to tell you. Um, but for the most part, the VHF, UHF stuff is short range, line of sight. Um, typically, we'll use a uh, what's called a repeater. Uh, it's a radio that you stick on a mountaintop or on top of a building that receives a signal and then rebroadcasts it. Yep. Uh, so the, the obligatory drawing is think of a mountain and you got a person over here with a radio and yeah. a person over here with a radio. They can't talk directly to each other, the but they can both way. talk to the top of the yep. mountain. Right. Yep. Um, and so uh, repeaters are useful in VHF and UHF like that. Mm -hmm. um, HF is the direct person to person stuff. That's the long, uh -huh. long range stuff. Uh, I do all of it. 
uh, both both of those. Um, some people only do one, some people only do the other. Um, and then th these are just the two kind of entry simple yeah. to explain Perfect. things. There yes. are a bajillion other things you can do with ham radio. Um, I typically view ham radio. Oh, uh, let me go back to what is ham radio. So it is a um, kind of an internationally defined thing. Uh, the rules are not exactly the same in all the different countries, but most countries have something that is called amateur radio uh, with the intention of being able to talk to other amateurs either in the same country and or other countries as well. Um, the whole point of amateur radio, the reason the governments still do it um, is because we... I'm going to get this wrong and I'm sure people are going to correct me, but the, uh, the <laughs> idea the internet's good at, yeah, everyone's <laughs> watch the chat. <laughs> um, we're meant, we are designed, we're designed. We are supposed to be experimenting like in the early days of radio in the early 20th, uh, early and mid 20th century. A lot of the new advancements in radio technology came out of amateurs just playing around with stuff. Yeah. Um, single side band and, and even AM and, uh, all that kind of stuff came out of amateurs experimenting with it. And even now, a lot of uh, new technology comes out of the amateur radio community. Uh, CDMA, uh, like some of the early cell phone technology, wasn't actually experimented with in amateur radio, but an amateur radio operator is the one who developed it and used his knowledge from cool. amateur radio to develop that. And I can't remember the guy's nice. name, but he's the, the guy who started Qualcomm. Ah, uh, he's a very, at least was a very active, right <laughs> very active ham. Yeah. Um, oh, that's cool though. Fun story. He's also the guy who wrote Procom. If any of you from the old BBS sure. days in the eighties and nineties, Procom was a mm -hmm. DOS terminal emulator. Same guy. Hmm. Um, anyway, uh, ba -do -ba -do. so, uh, experimentation to yeah. come up with new technologies. Uh, we're also, um, uh, very good in emergencies because none of the stuff that we do requires any infrastructure, right? It doesn't yep. require a telephone line. It doesn't require uh, an internet. Again, asterisk. We're yeah. getting into things that does make, make use of that sort of stuff, but the, the basis of the technology doesn't require any infrastructure. Yeah. And so when the shit hits the fan, I can swear radio. on this live stream. <laughs> I can't swear on my other ones, but she told me it was okay. It is okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. when the shit hits the fan and, yeah. you know, your cell networks are down or the internet's down or, yeah. or you don't have power or whatever, amateur radio operators are there and they can, they can communicate. Yeah. And so uh, we'll get called out um, like earthquakes, you know, we'll, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm in California. We're all in California. We're, we're in California here. So earthquakes yeah. are our natural disaster du jour. And um, fires now too. Oh, Don't and fires. Those. Yeah. Don't yeah. Those. yeah. Um, but like uh, uh, Red Cross will call yeah. us out and have us do communications for them and stuff like that. Yeah. It's super interesting. Like, so, you know, growing up in the USVI, um, radio played. Virgin Islands. Yes. U.S. Virgin Islands territory. It is part of the United States. Um, it, it's really interesting because the radio played a much bigger role in even just like um, in kind of person to person communications and community mm -hmm. communications, I would say, than it necessarily does here. And I mean, even the FM stations, right? Like yeah. when there was a hurricane, everybody would be broadcasting for like as long as they could yeah, kind yeah. of thing, just like updates. Um, you know, people would call into the radio station if they still had telephone to like report on what was going on on different islands, on different parts of the island. So, and like, it's, it's really weird to me that like the radio here does not, it like, there's never anything about like, if there's a local fire, there's just not even anything on the local radio stations about that. Yeah. And I probably have to go to FM and there's pro or AM and there's probably like some AM band that's like the emergency one that I don't know about, but it's just, it's odd for me that it seems like here at radio is just not that, the not used in that way. Broadcast, broadcast radio. Our broadcast yeah. radio in this area, especially, doesn't have a lot of local ownership. Yeah. It's produced mm -hmm. locally, yeah. but it's all owned by Clear Channel and, and, and whatever else. And so the programming is done elsewhere. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. KVEC, I, hmm. I can't remember whether KVEC is local still or not. Yeah. Um, but uh, back anyway, in, so yeah. yeah, so ham radio useful in emergencies yeah. and um, and also useful for innovation. Yep. Is there still kind of a community of people that just like hang out and chat? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's called rag chewing. <laughs> Wait, uh, what? <laughs> rag chew. A rag. R a g. Yes. Okay. Rag chew. Chewing so the rag. Just chewing okay. the rag. Got it. All right. Um, you hop on <laughs> any of the HF bands that are open at any given time, and you will hear people just 
talking. Just all right. Hanging out and having having a conversation that happens all the time. Now, speaking of profanity and and cursing, are yep. there still do the FCC rules that apply to broadcast radio about like yes. profanity and stuff also apply? Yes. Now? Okay. Uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell I'm by not. listening to certain frequencies <laughs> of uh, certain HF bands or uh, repeaters in certain mm -hmm. areas. Uh, it is defined by community standards. Okay. And All right. community standards have um, there. There's some. I'm sure there's good drama about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the general rule, if you want to be safe, is don't cuss on the radio. Uh, right. It's generally frowned upon. There are a few places where it is not enforced. Mm -hmm. um, I try to avoid those places, not because I don't like cussing, but because that's where the people who feel the need to cuss and ham radio hang out. And mm -hmm. those are generally not the people I want to hang out with. Right. Um, and uh, yes, so there are there are rules about cussing. There are rules about making a nuisance of yourself. Right. Like, mm -hmm. um I can't remember exactly how what they are, but you're, you're, yeah, I, I want to know how a bunch of ham radio people it, define it's, nuisance. Like. It's meant to be non. I don't know, Vince. Tell me what the rules are. You're you're <laughs> you're looking around. Um, <laughs> hams invented SSB. Yes, I believe so. Um, um, <laughs> citation God. needed. Citation. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, go listen to or read up on uh, the solder smoke uh, podcast is what I listen to, but they also have a blog. Um, Bill Mara has been talking a lot about SSB and he talks a lot about the early days of SSB and um, he links to a, I want to say a book that was written about the very early days of SSB and some of the early pioneers were definitely in the ham community. Hmm. Um, now it may have been invented for the war for World War II, um, but uh, uh, certainly a lot of the uh, the gear that does SSB was definitely pioneered by hands. Uh, so apparently FCC part 97 covers the rules. So I'll be oh, yeah. reading that before bed tonight. Oh, as yeah. a... <laughs> You're going to fall asleep in about 37 seconds. That's yeah. my hope. <laughs> yeah, part 97 rules are all the hands. Anyway, um, cool. I don't remember where I was going with this, but yeah, like you're, you're not supposed to make a nuisance okay. of yourself with like international, so, you're, you're promoting international goodwill because we're all talking long distance. So there's like, a, don't be a jerk. Yeah. General, don't yeah. be a jerk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Will Wheaton's cool. law definitely applies. Who, who do you like, who do you rat somebody out to who's being a jerk? <laughs> Um, and what's the fine like? <laughs> yeah, it used to be the FCC. However, okay, yeah. the FCC uh, got gutted several years ago, uh, yeah. and they don't have pretty much any enforcement arm anymore. So there's an organization <laughs> called the ARRL, the Amateur Radio Relay League. Hmm. They are, in the United States at least, kind of the uh, um, organization for the advancement of amateur radio. Okay. Um, they are the... Um, a term for it, like the, the community, like the like IEEE, a, but you know, that, that's sort of advocacy yeah, and advocacy education group, yeah. and outreach. Yeah. And, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Oh. Um, and they have what's called the volunteer monitor program, which huh? to me just sounds like that kid in school that would, Mrs. Brown, so exciting to me. And it sounds like that to me, but. Um, I they're, mean, Karens don't know what they're missing. They yeah. could like, they could really, really find their stream on like, yeah, find their stride on, on ham radio. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but it's they've been doing some good work because yeah. there is a lot of really just awful hmm. go like uh, seven point two five five megahertz on forty meters and most of eighty meters is covered with just jerks and there's a there's a two meter repeater down in the LA or four forty repeater down in the LA area that's known for just being a cesspool. So there there's kind of like the Reddit the Reddit yes. channels the Reddit frequencies of the ham yes okay. yes All yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, official observers monitor communications for compliance. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, two thumbs up for Bill Mara and Solder Smoke. Yes. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> I've been listening to Solder Smoke for years now. I love it. It's a wonderful podcast. Uh, it's all about making uh, HF radios. Uh, cool. he, uh, Bill feels very strongly about HDR, hardware defined radio. Mm, yeah. Um, and so he, mm. he's, he just likes putting I things like together. Yeah. No, I it's like great. It. Um, cool. Yeah. A local repeater, police, Brittany says. Yeah, pretty much. 
Uh, is that a Brittany? Brittany? That is, is that is yes. The, Brittany, okay. Brittany, the ham has Brittany? a ham Brittany. Yes, okay. Ham Brittany. We need to talk because <laughs> I don't want to like intrude on y'all's time, but Brittany and Carrie and my wife are all knitting <laughs> friends. And so I'm like yes. trying to be polite, but I definitely want to talk to you about ham radio stuff. So uh, give me a call if you ever want to chat about ham radio stuff. I, I want to encourage a more inclusive community in the area and harder I, than you think. I, I, I have heard scuttlebutt that, uh, I'm that, trying. Yeah. Ham I'm is so not trying. super inclusive. No, <laughs> I don't think it's exclusive, but it's definitely a bunch of old white dudes, especially in this area. So I'm trying to change why am, that. Why am I not surprised? No. <laughs> Yeah, Brittany and I have been joking about like having feminist radio hour. On, I would on love ham. that. I would love that. <laughs> We'd probably get reported as no, a nuisance. But... <laughs> no. Well, if they did, I would tell them to shut the hell up and take their uh, top of their hemorrhoids back to 80 meters. Uh, God. Go to around right. 3.8 sometime, 3.8 megahertz on single sideband, just lower sideband, just tune around and listen to some of the conversations they have on there. I'm sorry. Uh, so, are, so is there anybody doing like some, like, cool, oh, God. like, in, like diversity and inclusion kind of stuff on him, or just like in general making open and inclusive spaces? On yes, him? yes, like, there definitely are. Um, in um, I joined at one point just so that I could give them some money. There was a uh, LGBTQ ham group cool. down in Australia, I think. Um, I can't remember where that was. Uh, there's a gal named Ria. Ria RJ, and I'm, I see her name written all the time. Ria, you know who you are, and forgive me for uh, like Joram. I, I I have it visually, but I've never actually put the sounds in my head. Anyway, she is uh, one of the regional directors for the ARRL, and she's working on a cool. lot of inclusive stuff. She has nice. her own YouTube channel. Um, Vince, if you're still there, if you can find a link to uh, Rhea's stuff and paste it in the chat room, that would be great. Are there some good like learning resources that are particularly good at like welcoming newcomers and, you know, a bajillion, a bajillion? Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, KB6NU has a series of uh, learn to get your license books. There's one mm -hmm. for the technician license. There are three different license classes, technician, general and e extra. Mm -hmm. uh, so you start at the technician start it. The easiest one to get is technician. Yeah. You have to pass the test for the technician and another one to get your general. And then you have to pass mm -hmm. these two tests and a third one to get your extra. So that's kind of the order they're in. That's pretty cool though, because then you could say that like you're legitimately extra. That's if right. You, if I am process. totally extra. I, like, I am extra. amateur extra. Wait a <laughs> that kind of ruins it, doesn't <laughs> yeah. it? Anyway. <laughs> I think um, that's perfect, actually. <laughs> Dan's, uh, Dan's stuff, KB6NU, uh, I think he calls it the no nonsense guide. Uh, learn to get your license books. Yeah. Cool. So the first one for technician is free. You can download the PDF <laughs> or you can pay for it to, uh, you know, uh, pay for a print book if you prefer that uh, and proceeds go to help him do his stuff. Um, the ARRL handbook. ARRL handbook yeah. is not a cover to cover. The ARRL handbook is a great reference. Mm -hmm. um, it's about that thick. I uh, would not recommend right, anyone like, sit down and, and start really at the first page and just keep going. Um, but yeah, it sense. is a wonderful handbook, uh, uh, a reference book of, I need to know about this particular obscure aspect of a thing. Yeah. There it is. And you read three or four pages and you got it right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, they also have a handbook that is dedicated to antennas, mm -hmm. which is quite good as well because, and the antenna handbook is about yay thick and yeah. it warrants its own book. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of different things. Uh, hamstudy.org is another good one. Um, I got my licenses 25 to 20 years ago, right? I got my mm -hmm. extra 20 years ago, so I don't know what the current... I've been uh, extra for material. 25 years. <clears throat> I've been an extra That's for awesome. 20 years. I've been a ham <laughs> since 19... Fuck me, 30 years. Uh, I got my license in 91. Yeah. Uh, Multi-volume version of their handbook. Yeah, but I still wouldn't recommend starting at the beginning and going to read it through. <laughs> it's just, it's just unless you've got insomnia. Yeah, same book, separate, smaller. Yeah, numbers. exactly. So, so, what do you? You have a ham thing here. Let's, so, uh, yeah. Um, pardon all the dust. Um, 
Can we zoom we can, in a bit oh, on we that? Can zoom. We can zoom, zoom in. Enhance. We have to do it manually here, but we can do it. Zoom and enhance. Burp. All right. So um, this Lada. this is a device that I made. Um, that uh, yes, a quarter century. I'm more than a quarter century. I'm <laughs> almost a third of a century. Ham. So this is a device I made uh, several years ago when I was trying when we were doing field day. So field day is uh, exactly what it sounds like. You take your radios out into the field. The okay. whole idea is that it is a uh, preparedness exercise. Ah. You, like you have it in your permanently installed in your car or at your house or whatever. And that's great. You use those a lot to, mm -hmm. you know, so you know that that works. But if, again, the shit hits the fan, can you take gear, set it up in a field mm -hmm. and, you know, with no pre-existing infrastructure, do you put up an antenna? Can you power it? Do you have all of the cables? Do you have all the things you need to get a station on the air? Yeah. And so every year the ARRL puts on a contest called Field Day, the fourth full weekend in June. <laughs> um, and it's not a contest. <laughs> it's totally not a contest. Totally not a contest. Except that it's That's actually great. a contest. So yeah. well, what it is, the idea is you set up all your gear and you have 24 hours to try and talk to as many other hams as you can. Mm -hmm. And there are a bunch of other people doing it all over the place. It is cool. a very popular, very active, um, not a contest, uh, <laughs> a field training event exercise. And, um, but so contesting, what is contesting? Contesting is you're trying to talk to as many people as you can. Um, contests happen all the time. Field day is not the only one. Okay. So this is kind of a, a console for contesting. Okay. You have one radio that has a microphone and a speaker. Mm -hmm. I hate speakers because just the way my brain works, I work much better with headphones. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're in a noisy environment, the headphones oh, help yeah. block out the noise. And sometimes you're trying to listen to a whole bunch of static and there's somebody speaking right there, right above the noise. And you're trying to pick <laughs> out their call sign and you can't. And it's easier. Yeah, it's easier to do. To yeah. focus on that for whatever reason. So headphones, yeah. headsets are very common. Headsets are, are very yeah. common. He headphones yeah. are very common. And then you want a little boom mic. And then um, when you're doing contesting, especially with field day, because the people who are doing field day are typically not contesters. When you're a contester, there's somebody that goes and does a lot of contests. There's basically mm -hmm. a contest every weekend mm -hmm. of, of one form or another. So those people are very good at it and they can, mm -hmm. they can operate the radio and they can log their contacts on the computer or on mm -hmm. a piece of paper. They can do all of that at the same time. Yeah. But field day, you typically have people who are not regular contesters. It's kind of, it's kind of the, the, um, I don't want to say beginner hour, but it, it's people come out of the woodwork to do field day that don't normally do contesting. Yeah. Um, and so it's very common to have one person operating the radio, mm -hmm. doing the doing the mic and the talking and, and all of that. And then another person who is the logger, whose job it is to type in all of that information and log the contact. You need mm -hmm. to know who you talk to in field day. And then there, when you're doing a contest, you need to know who you talk to, what band, what time, mm -hmm. and then typically some piece of information that's called the exchange. Mm -hmm. And whatever that exchange is, de changes depending on the contest. Okay. For field day, it's what is their ARRL section and uh, what is their class, which how many trans transmitters and various things. Anyway, it, um, pieces of information you need to exchange and okay. you need to log all of this stuff for all the contacts you make. And in a weekend, mm -hmm. you may make a thousand, two thousand, three thousand contests, 10,000 contacts yeah. uh, for the really big contesting stations where they've got, you know, 20 people all operating the radio all the time day and night for 24 hours. And these will mostly, these, so these will be people in your area as well as around the All world, over the country. All over the country? The okay. field day is, is a U.S. and Canada contest. Okay. Um, I can get points for talking to people outside of the country, mm -hmm. but it's mostly people in the U.S. and Canada trying to talk to other people in the U.S. and Canada. Okay. Um, but so you got these two people who are trying to use the radio at the same time. Well, only yeah. one person's going to be talking, but the other person needs to be able to listen. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if the two could hear each other because ah. sometimes you'll have the logger say, what was that? What was that call sign? Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the person who's operating needs to do it again or the, the other way around or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I wanted to have a box that I could plug two headsets into mm -hmm. and a radio mm -hmm. in the other side. Yeah. Right. And so the operator's microphone goes into the radio. Mm -hmm. The okay. logger's microphone goes into the operator's headset and the yep. operator's microphone also goes into the logger's headset so they right. can hear each other. Okay. Uh, the audio from the radio goes it's into, into both, both their headsets. Yep. And you want to be able to adjust the volumes of all of those things yep. individually, right? <laughs> so basically what this is, is nice. a, it's a three channel, three bus mixer. Nice. Right. So the three inputs are the microphones from the two headsets mm -hmm. and the speaker coming from, from the, radio. the radio. So, and then the, so then 
these then, are all the volume knobs for all correct. of them. Correct. So the logger Logger-er. has their own yep. three volume mixer. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Your that's list, the that's the, yeah. So the logger Logger's can hear side. their own audio if they want to hear yep. their, if they want a side tone, mm -hmm. they can hear the operator's audio and the radio audio. Cool. And then the operator cool. has the sa same three thing. same controls. Yeah. Uh, but for their own headset. Yep. And then going out to the radio, you have uh, the operator and the logger because yep. you might occasionally want to like swap who's using the radio at any given time. And an external speaker for speaker people. For people uh, or just anybody right. walking by. Just, oh, okay. Like if, yeah. if somebody's walking by, like, I want to hear what you guys are doing because yeah. normally with the headsets, you can only hear what I'm saying. You can't yeah. hear what the people are saying back to me. So if somebody's walking by hmm. and they want to hear it, they can just turn up the, the external speaker cool. volume a little bit. Um. And so that's that's all this is. And oh, look I designed at you. This. you wrote the values of all of your uh, components on your board, I'm noticing. <laughs> so when I build something as a kit or if yeah. I'm going to assemble it myself, I don't bother with um, uh, reference Refer values. I, I, yeah, reference, des reference designator. I put the values on the board. Um, it's a bummer if that's you ever want to change a value, no. but it makes it super easy to assemble. Because yeah. now I'm not having yeah. to cross reference with the document. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of kits do both now yeah. or or just or just the one actually if, if it's a pretty simple kit but so yeah. this is this is a board that i designed cool. and assembled myself nice and so that's what it is um what are the green and red leds signifying? so uh they were meant to be in that you'll note that uh, notebooks is on the bottom side of the board the the comparator that populates that drives those isn't mm -hmm. actually populated right now but it was supposed to be a very simple vu meter um, huh. because these two little pots right here mm -hmm. adjust the microphone game. Ah. And so the idea was that you would set the micro, you would talk into it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's headset is a little bit different, how close to their mouth their microphone yeah. is and how yeah. loud their voice is and yep. whatever else. So you want to be able to adjust the mic gain, uh, for, in, for individual situations. And you want it to blink the green, but not the red. Oh, cool. That was nice. the idea. Nice. And that would get it into about line level, yeah. uh, which would match with everything else and then send, send that off to the radio. Cool. Um, I am hoping that this turns into a product at some point. Ooh, I, I exciting, am start, exciting. I am starting a business now, um, Halibut Engineering. Halibut Engineering. Um, I, the first you, product you I'm working on. You need a badass fish logo. I know, and, I, and I'm, I'm thinking of going to Fiverr. I don't know any artists that I'll can do. I'll hook you up. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, yes, because I do want yeah. a badass fish logo. Yeah. Um, I am working on a product that I'm not talking about right now, but it is a ham radio hardware related product. Hopefully I'll have more to say about that come February-ish. February is my deadline because that's when my money to be to able to- screw around? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's when my fuck around money runs out. <laughs> that, That's when I have to go find a real job if I can't turn this into a real job. So I'm hoping that sometime around February or before I'll know more. I'm, I'm, Secret I'm, product. <laughs> I'm a big fan of turning things you love into real products. Component so. values on PCB instead of component index. Yeah, that's yep. that's my personal favorite way of doing it. Yeah. Um, as John noted, nice audio mixer for field day. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one does cool. not do anything with PTT or with uh, the push to talk. You know, I want to okay. key up the radio right. uh, or with Morse code keys or anything like that. Mm -hmm. This is just an audio mixer. Cool. Uh, cool. But yeah, anyway, so when I get done with the other secret scroll project that I'm working on, this is one of the things that I hope to productize and start and, selling. And what's the best way to keep in touch with you and your secret scroll products? Uh, At Smitty Halibut on Twitter, S-M-I-T-T-Y-H-A-L-I-B-U-T. And or... Um, the right way. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I will definitely be talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> I will definitely be talking about it on the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. By the way, plug for the Ham Radio Workbench. Um a bi-weekly deep dive into making topics of interest to the amateur radio, to the radio amateur. I, hmm. I don't, George, your, your job is, is safe. Don't worry. I'm not going to be taking <laughs> over your spot anytime soon, but uh, Vince is a regular uh, Vince from the chat room is a regular on the ham radio workbench uh, as well. So cool. 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 So how did you first get into ham? Like what was, what is your, is, is, is a ham story? A yeah. Story? No, I mean, it's not that exciting. Um, <laughs> My dad was the first one to tell me about ham radio, but he himself was not a ham. Okay. Uh, so I, I like when I was a young kid, I got a Radio Shack 50 in one kit. Ooh. You remember those kits with the little springies I, and the wires and things? I did not have one, but I've in the, seen They didn't photos. have those in the VI? No, no, no they didn't. Okay. Wait, I mean, I think, yeah, there was a Radio Shack on the island, I think. On okay. St. Thomas, at least. Yeah. But, yeah. So anyway, I had one of those and one of the kits, or one of the... One of the 50 mm -hmm. was an AM broadcast receiver. Yeah, I mean, it was just a little simple diode detector and a LC tank circuit. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I built that and I started receiving KGO because KGO mm -hmm. is transmitting like a bajillion watts just a few miles from our house. <laughs> so like I can't receive anything else except KGO on, on that radio. Um, and, uh, and my dad helped me string up a wire in our backyard. So I had a long and fed wire that coming mm -hmm. in the window that turned mm -hmm. into this thing. And I just started listening to AM broadcast radio on this little radio that I made. And when cool. I was doing, I was probably in third grade, fourth grade, something like mm -hmm. that. And he told me about amateur radio at that point. He's like, you can get mm -hmm. licensed and take a test and be able to transmit on it. Uh, and I thought that was cool, but I never did anything with it. Mm -hmm. And then I went and got into high school. Uh, I think it was the summer after my sophomore year. Uh, I started working at an electronics junk store in Mountain View called Haltech Electronics. Mm -hmm. Not Halted, okay. Halted Specialties. Everybody okay. knows about HSC, okay. Halted Specialties. Um, it was very similar to Halted Specialties, but it was in Mountain View, not Sunnyvale. It was called Haltech. Uh, apparently, they were started by the mm -hmm. same guy, but anyway, it, big long story. Was his it, name but, Hal? I, that's my guess. Um, <laughs> I never worked for Hal, um, but uh, it was an electronics surplus store, right? And the guy I worked for, yeah, I know. Excess Solutions. I'm yes. just going to like plug Excess Solutions yes. right now because, oh man. Weird stuff, so HSC, so all those places. So and I think Excess Solutions is the only it's one that's the, still open. Yeah, it's the I know, at least in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, so I was working at Holtec. This was back in 1991. And uh, my boss was a ham. Russ Rocket, N6, I don't remember his call <laughs> sign. I'd have to go look it up. Um, but he was a ham, and <clears throat> I knew about ham radio, and he was kind of encouraging me to get licensed. And another guy I worked with, Greg Creech, he and I were both studying to get our technician license. And one day, one Saturday at lunch, Russ is like, all right, you guys have a couple of hours off. Go up to uh, Ampex on the peninsula. This was in Mountain View mm -hmm. and go up to Ampex in the peninsula and take your test. And we went up and we got our we got our technician licenses. Cool. Um, and uh, one of the first transmitters I built was a three meter transmitter. Nice. So all you on the show, on the live stream, do the math. <laughs> figure out what I mean by a three meter transmitter. The first person to figure it out and type it into uh, the chat room will get a Ooh. get a, a, a surprise for me. Applause. Surprise. I'll give you some applause. <laughs> um, so the first transmitter I ever built was a three meter transmitter, uh, wideband FM. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. Uh, I'm guessing that three meters is like the wavelength. Or yes. Something. Yes. Okay. So yeah. uh, that it didn't just transmit for three meters. No, no, no. That would be no, a little. It is a wavelength. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yes, three. Yes. Yes. Just at access to solutions, new location. I, yes. Incredibly musty. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Everything it has a very nice dust coating. It's yeah. It has oh. a smell when you go in there. You sneeze. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually a lot nicer during COVID because you're wearing a mask. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. less. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, how do you spell that? Saguaro? Saguaro Suar links? Saguaro links. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, no, like, like I'm, not saying the I'm not saying the antenna was three meters. The wavelength was three meters. Do the math. Do the math. <laughs> 300, 300 million meters per second is, is the speed of light. Uh, so, okay. if I have a wavelength of three, three meters, meters, how many yeah. cycles per second is that? That's like a megahertz. Is that, am I doing that right? So um, 300 Sorry, million cycles three, per second. Or 300 three three million times meters. 10 to the eighth, yeah. not times 10 to the sixth. So yes. It's like, so, it's like 100 megahertz. 100 right? megahertz. That's correct. Where is 100 megahertz? Uh, that's FM band. FM broadcast right? band. Yeah. Yeah. You are correct. Yeah. Smack dab in the middle of yeah. the FM broadcast. Okay. Wide band FM um, transmissions. Nice. 75 kilohertz deviation. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're probably not supposed to be broadcasting. On no, the no. Band. no, okay. no, 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 okay. no, no, no. Okay. I was so the first that, transmitter like I built. Regulated. Yeah. The first transmitter I yeah. built was a pirate radio station. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Kind of like these little kits that, that I that have, we're which we're have. probably not going to do today, but I yeah. still think are kind of neat. I just got these on Amazon and <laughs> they're by Bogert time, which I keep on wanting to say yogurt time, <laughs> but they have like this little kit. So there's like a little, uh, you know, little receiver yep. and then like a little FM radio transmitter, which is like unamplified and probably super wussy, but can I, I open that up yeah, yeah, yeah. because I was looking but, at the picture of this you know, and I'm trying to understand how they're transmitting. I, quite, you I know, theory, I want to see if my theory is right. 
We'll see. Is it just a 53? 53, 53, 51. What do you got going on there? Oh, uh, hang on. You got that there. Oh, there we go. Can we switch over yep, to that? We can switch over. Boy. Oh, the little chip? Yeah. You can zoom in more on it. I, I don't know how to. I, I'm go. gonna break it. <laughs> you will not break the microscope. It is fine. It. We have way more things on the bench than I usually do. Okay. So. Big knob is focus. Little knob is zoom. And yeah, you can move the eyepieces and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what chip that is. Is it the uh, little one or the big one? That no, the little one. Little one? Yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't <laughs> figure I can't make it yeah, out. All right, never mind. They it, probably, can be, it can be really hard to see. I'm wondering if that's an SI5351, which any ham radio maker will understand, will recognize that number. It's a um, signal generator chip. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, I think they have a uh voltage input that will modulate frequency modulate the signal mm -hmm. and i was wondering if they're just using an mm -hmm. si5351 as an fm transmitter chip so anyway yeah. uh, digression uh it's a lot easier to make fm broadcast transmitters now than it was back in the 90s when i was doing <laughs> it um Eep. don't follow that okay how did i get into ham radio mm -hmm. so that was that um and i used my my powers for evil in high school. Excellent. FM broadcast. Um, I didn't really know any other hams other than my coworkers, so I didn't do a whole lot with it in high school. But when I got to college at Cal Poly, uh, I found W6BHZ, which is the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club. Oh. And cool. yeah. that, like, my life was changed. Uh, not entirely for the better because uh, <laughs> it took me six and a half years to graduate college. So, you know, but I did graduate. <laughs> I do have my degree, which is more than I can say for a lot of BHZers. BHZ alone. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so anyway, the um, and I uh, got super active in the BHZ club, um, and I'm nice. still tentatively or uh, tenuously associated with the with the college club. Oh, cool. Um, I join them occasionally for things, but uh, mostly nice. these days I do uh, just kind of do my own thing or with the ham radio workbench. So, so like what do you like about ham? What, what like keeps you in it? What keeps you on the airwaves? Like, so for me, ham radio is an enabler for other things. So mm -hmm. um, we talk about this a lot on the uh, workbench podcast. I, oh. What is it? I think he called it a propagation ham. I don't remember the exact term George uses for it, but basically <laughs> I like building things. So it's a gateway drug basically it, into building electronics and. Yeah. And stuff. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it is a context I, I that, in yeah. which I, I use it to do other things. Yeah. Um, I actually don't like talking on the radio a lot, <laughs> which is That's ironic, funny. but that is funny, <laughs> but more common than you might think. Um, yeah. As it turns out, there are a lot of hams that I talk to. They're like, yeah, I don't operate a lot. Yeah. Um, but I like building things and it's a fun context to build things in. Um, I can do lots of receivers, which you don't need a license to build a receiver, at least not in right. the U S. Yeah. Um, but there are, I've got like an APRS uh, automatic packet reporting system, but it's like you have a GPS and a radio and it beacons your trend, your position every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Not super great if you're trying to remain hidden yeah, or private, right, and day -to -day yeah. but it's fantastic if you're doing something like supporting a bicycle race. Are you familiar oh, with yeah. the Wildflower Triathlon? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a big half uh, half Ironman triathlon that used to be up here in San Luis County, the oh, Cal Poly yeah. Amateur Radio Club. I didn't it's, realize so it used to be up here. It's like, a, yeah, I it's thought it was moderate. like, okay. Lake San Antonio. Yeah. Uh, here, as in you go up to yeah. Paso to get to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Lake San Antonio, and it was here for here um, for 20 years, 30 years, hmm. something like that. It was, it was a long time. Uh, and the Amateur Radio Club at Cal Poly did communications for it uh, for many, many, nice. many years. And I was involved in that. And since I had a motorcycle with mm. APRS on it, they sent me out to chase the bicycles around the bike course. Oh, nice. And so, uh, you know, my bike would just show up on a map. Yeah. And they would know wherever my motorcycle is, that's where the lead yeah. cyclist was. 
right? And so they didn't have to keep calling out, you know, where are you? What mile marker are you mm -hmm. at now, Mark? You know, I'm at mile marker such and such. I didn't have to, they didn't have to keep doing that. I just cool. followed the cyclist and my position would show up. So there are nice. times when EPRS is very nice to have, not something I turn on every day. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but you can set up a receiver that listens to the APRS broadcast and uh, sends that off to the internet. There are um, other signals. Uh, there's one particular called Whisper. It's weak signal propagation reporting. It's a very low power beacon that you can set up. And then other people have receivers that if you know where you're beaconing from and you know where the receiver is and you know roughly how much power was put out mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and you have enough of these, yeah. you end up kind of building a map yeah. of this is where propagation is open to. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things about HF propagation is that it changes from time to time, from yeah. hour to hour, yeah. day to day, like from daytime to nighttime, uh, from one place with the same gear, the same transmit power, mm -hmm. the same antenna, same radiation patterns, everything, one minute yeah. you'll be able to talk to that person over there, but not hear that person. Yeah. The next minute you'll hear that person, but not that person, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the third minute you'll hear both of them, right? Like so, yeah. the propagation changes all the time. Yeah. Um, and just recently, people build these these beacons that will transmit a signal, and then the other side is the receiver hmm. of that signal. Mm -hmm. And uh, with enough of these things, you can just kind of map out where propagation Your is going at any given That's time. That's kind of cool. Yeah. You can like basically map out like your RF weather. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. Huh. So cool. lots of things like that. And I just like building things. Um, I like doing contests like field day. I really enjoy field day. I'm not a, a regular contester. I don't do all contests on weekends and whatnot, but um, yeah. I, like the, I like the social aspect of it. Yeah. I like the building and the social aspect of it. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. So, so tell us, tell us more about what else you got on this, on this workbench here. Okay. There's some like cool fish amps or something that's fish going amps. on here. All right. So um, <laughs> that's all I brought with me from an amateur radio perspective. Do you want to go oh, into yeah. badge life next or do you want to go into audio? Let's file? do audio file next right. and then we'll do badge life. Third. So I like listening to music with good Ooh. quality headphones and good quality sources and everything like that. So I built, according to the date on this board <laughs> in 2011, I built this headphone amplifier. Um, it's a little metal box and it's got four knobs on the front. Mm -hmm. uh, three of them are volume knobs. It's got three different line level inputs. I wanna try to like get this at a different angle because okay. I feel like people need to appreciate the these inside. knobs. Because, well, no, the knobs. Knobs, yes. So like, it's These funny, like one wooden... of my exactly like one of the one of the maker groups that I'm in, we we regularly appreciate things like knobs and yeah. like, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's really important to get the right size of the feel. And these are like all wood yep. knobs. So and they're the... quite beautiful. I wish like yeah, we should have better lighting. Thing. Yeah, let's do that. There we go. So bump, bump up the exposure a little bit. So, yeah, it's it's really kind of really kind of beautiful. I was just kind of like, what is this with these so, knobs and this like enormous, enormous freaking coil? <laughs> toroidal transformer, yeah. <laughs> Love it. So Love the it. knobs are guitar knobs from Carvin. And I think hmm. the four of them were like 20 bucks. So they're they're that's not, not cheap, but they're not expensive. Uh, for knobs, yeah. for wood knobs, that's not bad. Yeah, and they're beautiful, and I love them. And I thought they looked really you know, good like on, the, five on, the, five bucks each? on the black anodized case. Yeah. Um, so what it is, is that it's three channel mixer, mm -hmm. excuse me, mm -hmm. three input channels, uh, and all of the inputs get mixed together and sent into a audio amplifier. Mm -hmm. Now I've pulled the op amp out of this particular board because I'm, uh, I'm, this is my version one of the product and I'm not using this one anymore, uh, but the, um, I kept it together just as kind of like a history piece, if you will, but that, that kind of hodgepodge of headers there. <laughs> you know how op amps either come in singles or in duels? Mm -hmm. Some, there are audiophile op amps that the audiophile yes. community likes. They, they think have a particularly good sound. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually been able to detect like in gross terms, the differences between a Burr Brown and a analog devices. Hmm. But when you get into, these are several different Burr Browns, I'm like, okay, I can't right. tell the difference between yeah. all of those. Interesting. Uh, hmm. But I have been able to kind of detect a difference between Burr Brown and um, 
AD. Which is now TI. Which is now Burr Brown is now TI, yes. <laughs> if you're wondering what the hell Burr Brown is. <laughs> yes, it's there they've been TI for, for a while now. 15, 20 years yeah. now. In any case, some audiophile op amps only mm -hmm. come in singles and yep. some op amps only come in duels. Yep. And so I didn't want to put a dual in there and then have to have like an adapter or mm -hmm. a single in there and have you know two singles. Mm -hmm. and so I figured out that you can it's not that hard to make it like lay it out so mm -hmm. that if you have a dual, you put it, do you have a, a pointer? Uh, yes. Know, point, a wee, pointy things. A, a wee pointy screwdriver. Things. So if you have a dual op amp chip, you put it in that row and that row. <laughs> and if you've got two okay. singles, you put one of them oh, in that row no and that way. row and that row and that row. Damn. That's and cool. the, the routing underneath is actually pretty, pretty simple, good. pretty huh. simple to make that work out. <laughs> That's so, awesome. so that one socket outline will work I for either it. single or dual op amps. I love the, the matrix op amp socket. That's yeah. super cool. Um, and then so the op amp provides uh, voltage gain, mm -hmm. um, but op amps are especially the audiophile op amps are relatively high output impedance. They're not good okay. for driving headphones. So mm. these op amps are followed by current buffers. Um, and yep. I can't remember the part number on this six four uh, six three two one LM six three two ones or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what they are, um, but some current buffers. They're okay. voltage yeah. follower current buffers, and they can provide up to I think two hundred milliamps um, mm -hmm. or whatever. Any and um, the current buffers are in the feedback loop mm -hmm. using an architecture called the Jung multi loop, developed by Walt okay. Jung, Doctor Walt Jung. Okay, um, or it might be pronounced Jung, J U N G. Um, Walt Young, Walt Jung, I'm not sure how. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Anyway, um, so this is an op amp or mm -hmm. a amplifier design that was lifted almost uh, almost mm -hmm. directly from a, uh, a amplifier called the Pi Meta P I M E T A version two mm -hmm. uh, on TangentSoft.net. If you're interested in looking <laughs> at it, so you can go to TangentSoft and look at uh, the design for the Pi Meta V2. That is basically what I've got here. I made some modifications to it though. Um, I have my op amp in inverting mode. Mm -hmm. The Pi Meta is in non-inverting mode. The advantage of using it in inverting mode is that it doubles as a mixer. Ah, and that's what I brought to the table. So I've got multiple inputs on this because I like having my personal computer plugged into it, my work computer plugged into it, and maybe my turntable or mm. uh, my personal computer and my amateur radio and my phone or you know whatever. I want multiple... Um, it does sound like young. Okay, thank you. Oh, cool. Um, so uh, I, I wanted multiple sources all going into the same headphones. I hate having to like put take off one headset and pick up another one, mm -hmm. um, or uh, you know, to make a phone call or whatever. Right? Like I just I just hate having to do all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this stuff up here was supposed to be for a microphone amplifier. The idea was to have one microphone in and that that would get split out to multiple different places. So like mm -hmm. a, a the line into your mm -hmm. computer. And uh, this one you'll notice is actually four pin because it was meant to go to an iPhone. So I think I never got all of that work. I think it's interesting that you've made a mixer and not sort of tackled that same problem by just doing a switch. Because so, I don't, I don't yeah. want to have to switch anything. You just don't want to have to switch. I just, so, I just want it all going into the same place. Yeah. Legit. Because I, I'm Legit. Not, I'm rarely you're, ever you're listening gonna, to more than one at a time. You're not going to have them both on at the same yeah. time. So Yeah, but I just so don't want to have to switch back and forth. And you just want to mix it. Yep. That's interesting. Yep. Hmm. Um, this is the power supply section here. Uh, we got 18, or excuse me, 36 volt center tapped. So two 18 uh, volt 18 AC signals, uh, eight, you know, mm -hmm. 180 degrees out of phase coming into here. Hmm. Bridge rectifier, filters. Yep voltage regulators, and that's the power out, right? So it's a cool. plus and minus linear regulator over here. Um, and then the fourth knob is a very ill-advised base boost. <laughs> Don't bother. I, <laughs> yeah, it's just <laughs> just <laughs> short over it. Don't do anything with it. I, I, that was a mistake putting it into the circuit. Was so it too bassy or just um, muddled base? Or yeah, what, was, what was the mistake? Part? Yeah, the, the, you, you have to like choose your value of uh feedback capacitors very or uh, series capacitors very carefully mm -hmm. to to tune where the base is yeah and it wasn't very sharp which is good but it also fucks with i forgot we can swear here it fucks with the phase of the base um when you have a capacitor in well, series with yeah. and, and it's going yeah. to right yeah. you get a you get a phase phase pull from the uh, or a phase response from your rc mm -hmm. thing and um 
one of the things I like about music is listening to very precise, crisp bass. Mm, so yeah. this one, I can't remember whether this one is DC coupled. This amplifier is definitely DC coupled. Mm -hmm. So there is, there are no DC blocking caps in this path. There okay. is no distortion from yep. DC blocking caps. And I've also gotten into the habit of, I'm putting my hand on another <laughs> amplifier. Yes, another thing. And, and so this is the version two of this beautiful amp. wood thing. So, going on. um, can we zoom out a little bit on oh, that? Yeah, okay. So this is my version two of the same amplifier design or similar amplifier design. I have to point out the cool fish. Yes. <laughs> You'll notice cool ASCII fish. that one's got one bubble, <laughs> well, yep, two, two bubbles, bubbles, three bubbles, bubbles. and four bubbles. Uh -huh. So those are your lines one, two, and three, and four. Uh, and then uh, on the inputs on the back, um, again, a fish with one bubble, two bubbles, three bubbles, and four bubbles. Nice. So that's where I, uh, nice. that's how you select the channels. Um, <laughs> But uh, so this is uh, kind of the a similar design, the, the newer version of this design. First off, shout out to Philip Schumann at Schumann Projects on both YouTube and Twitter uh, for making these wonderful wooden cases for me. Um, he's a just a wonderful woodworker and he's a, been a friend of mine for 20 years. Uh, and so uh, when I was putting this together and I was asked, talking to him about mm -hmm. case ideas, he and I worked together on designing this case. Nice. And I, I love it. It's beautiful. The front and back panels are circuit boards because oh. JLC PCB makes making circuit boards dirt cheap. Yep. Um, and you can lay out the exact design and holes and everything get and get it routed out exactly the way you want it. Yep. Um, and, you know, it's copper clad, so it's insulating, mm -hmm. right? It's shielding. Uh, cool. Although this that's, particular. That's funny. I totally assumed that these were like aluminum pieces. But now, yep. now that you say that, of nope, course, it's I copper see clad. It, like, yeah. So, um, <laughs> anyway, so this is the second version of the board. Ooh, with another op amp thing going on here. Yep. Yes. So the exact same op amp nice. design. Um, let's, see, let's do it this way. No. Uh, put that underneath there. <laughs> zoom? zoom back in. Yeah. Zoom. Zip it. Sometimes we need to uh, help center. it focus. There, there we, go. we go. Okay. Um, and of course, all the reflections. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can we take the, it, make, it put just, a shorter one in there? Yeah. Oh, that's like too right short. There. Curses. I know. We've got to have something that's like about the right size around here. Try that. That works. Yeah. There we go. That works yeah. well. Okay. Uh, also, mm -hmm. sneak peek at what we'll be talking about a little <laughs> bit later. <laughs> DEFCON 14. Okay. Um, so all of the same parts are largely here, right? So we've still got the uh, uh, AC center tapped audio in or um, um, power in uh, full wage, full wave bridge rectifier, filtering caps, voltage regulators, filtering caps, power out, mm -hmm. right? Here's the similar uh, analog section. So the same uh, single or dual op amp here. These are different current buffers. What are these? These are there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, these are good up to like 300 milliamps. So a little bit more power, uh, some heat sinks for it here. Mm -hmm. And then the four different inputs. Um, I used different pots on these. So you'll note that there's a big square there. Audio files mm -hmm. have like a fetish, fetishistic <laughs> relationship with an Alps pot called the Alps R, uh, RK27. Okay. It is called the Blue Velvet. Oh my pot. God. I mean, I feel well, like I, am, I, feel am like I have so to do not, this whenever I say I, that. I know. I am so um, not surprised. But yes, I, Wima caps. The same point in time. It's and hilarious. a new trick jack. Yes, Brent is recognizing all, <laughs> all of the, the audiophile components nice. on here. Um, so all the Wima caps all the way across. Um, and the new trick um, output jack. These are stepped attenuators. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you okay. turn these, you'll they, oh, they go yeah, in yeah, steps. Yeah, they have the little ratchets yeah. in them. Yep. yep. So um, they're made by, um, if you open one up, mm -hmm. it's actually a little circuit board with lots of little surface mount resistors in a ladder. Oh, interesting. And huh. the advantage of doing it that huh. way is that it's using 0.1% resistors. Ooh. So it's Dang, the so it's exact like resistance. Precise. The exact resistance yeah. doesn't matter as yeah. much as both the left channel and the right channel being the same yeah. resistance. Yep. So we're more interested in matching the left and right channels than we are about having, this is exactly one dB more than the, yeah. you know, whatever. Yep. Um, so step attenuators track mm -hmm. incredibly mm -hmm. precisely. The right. downside is you've got 20 steps. Yeah. Right? Like I think these are 20 step attenuators. They, mm -hmm. they make 
better stepped attenuators, but they're much bigger, like 45 steps and stuff mm -hmm. like that. They're much bigger and much, much, much more expensive. I like these. These work well for my use case, but you can also mm -hmm. put the RK27s on there. Um, the other one, mm -hmm. the other one I've built like this has RK27s on there. Mm -hmm. But this has four different inputs, uh, four different volumes. They all get mixed yep. into the same bus, amplified and out to the headphone amplifier. Cool. Uh, I simplified this circuit a lot. I um, removed the bass boost. <laughs> I saw. Um, the Pi Meta also had a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like this transistor di LED diode circuit that was supposed mm. to draw like a fixed amount of current through the op amp okay. to get it to go into class A. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. I never, um, I never got it set up the way I like it. I never mm -hmm. really noticed a benefit to it. Um, so I just removed that from the circuit. Mm -hmm. So simplified this a fair bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyway, and the mm -hmm. output goes through here, but it goes through this little relay. Um, are you familiar? You're familiar with like a reset controller on a microcontroller? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a circuit yeah, yeah. for the viewers. It's a circuit that looks at your power rail and says if the power is outside of, or below in this particular case, if yeah. it's below a certain value, then pull my chip into reset. Right. Because so, otherwise you get really weird flaky behavior, yeah, basically. So yeah. you want to make sure that your processor is operating like really well within its specified voltage range and is not like in some sort of weird state. And so as you turn on your power supply, you know, the power starts to come up and it might get up to a point where the processor starts working, but not very well. Um, you know, and it stays in this kind of weird state and you get into like yeah. these weird things. So you want a reset controller that holds the CPU into reset until the power supply comes up. Yep. It's nice and solid. And then most reset okay. controllers have a, all right, once it's in the right realm, I'm going to wait another some amount of time. Some hysteresis. So, yep. Some hysteresis. And then we'll release reset on the microcontroller. Yeah. Uh, so I'm using that chip, that reset controller, to look at the power supply coming up. And I have a super long time constant. I think mm -hmm. right now it is set to 10 seconds. Uh, and so it holds in reset yeah. for 10 seconds or so. And then releasing reset flips that that relay. Okay. Um, and in the normally closed position of that relay, the output of the amplifier goes through resistors to ground. Mm -hmm. And so that eliminates that, that you know, normally when you turn on an amplifier, you get that pop yeah, as all the yeah, startup yeah. transients of everything mm -hmm. until all okay. your biases even out and everything like that. Yeah. All of that goes through a resistor to ground. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it. I could probably flip the relay after like half a second or a second mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be a problem. But mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, if I remember, so that 10 microfarad right there mm -hmm. is what's setting the time constant. And if I remember correctly, ah, it's about okay. one second per microfarad. Uh, or it might be one second per 10 yeah. microfarads, okay. whatever it is. So mm -hmm. the thing powers on and it keeps your headphones disconnected for some amount of time. And then after everything's mm -hmm. up and solid, then it connects your headphones. You hear a little click and there's actually an LED on the front for nice. that check mark is power is okay. So basically whenever yeah. the, uh, whenever the relay is, is triggered, that LED mm -hmm. goes on. So it tells you when your when your power is good. Cool. Um, I call that my pop stopper. A very pop clever stopper. name. I like it. <laughs> so it's a pop stopper, pop stopper circuit. <laughs> Uh, so that's the version 2.0 of this board. Nice. I did some experimenting nice. with like little bus grounds and, and it, mm -hmm. not, I should have done yeah. pours. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. this one was very super noisy. Uh, um, and I ended up redoing it with uh, with ground pours and it's a heck of mm -hmm. a lot better, but not perfect. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a version 2.2 where all of the signals will be on the center layers and the top and bottom layer will be uh, solid grounds. Ground. Yeah. Um, and so just completely shield all of the signals inside the middle of the board. This is a four layer board. Where's this is a four layer board. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Yeah. So that's my headphone amplifier. This nice. is another thing that I'm hoping to turn into a product at some point. Cool. I like the caps on those. They're very gold and, and pretty looking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, I think I got these at um, XS, XS Solutions. Solutions. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, like these are normally two or three dollars a piece. And I think yeah. I got like 10 of them for a buck. And so yeah, I'm just sounds like. Sounds about right. <clears throat> what value are those? Uh, these are 2200 2200 yeah. microfarads, okay. yeah. 50 volts. Cool. Um, and it was literally just give me the cardboard box, pour it in the bag. I will yep. buy the whole so whole stock of them. Yep. Uh, these are uh, nice. good. I think Nishion, Nikon, Nishikon, Nishikon, Nishikon. Yeah. yeah, I think. So, 
And then oh, the red boxes are actually the ones that everybody was talking about earlier. Uh, these are Wema. Yeah. Uh, they're German uh, oh. foil caps. Well, they're um, German, so they have to be good, right? They must be good. <laughs> um, Hunter puffs on the inputs to shunt an ERF to ground. Huh. Um, and then the, the pots are 10K. So if you do the math, <laughs> 100 puff and 10K comes out to 160 kilohertz. Um, I try to design all of my high passes and low passes to be at least three octaves outside of the audible range. Uh, mm -hmm. So audible is 20 to yeah. 20K. So 20 to 40, 40 to 80, 80 to 160. Because it'll roll off. It's not going to be like perfect. And you're you're trying to get low distortion, right? Low distortion. Yeah. Phase distortion is yeah. what I'm trying to avoid. I really want to get away from the phase distortion. And if you roll off at 20 kilohertz, not only is that the 3 dB down point, right, yeah. but, like, um, but the phase distortion goes well past that mm -hmm. 3 dB down point. Yep. So my rule of thumb is to try and get two to three octaves away. And on the low side, it's 20 to 10, 10 to 5, 5 to 2 and a half hertz. Mm -hmm. So um, if I do put DC blocking caps in, in my circuit anywhere, I will make sure that they are at least 2.5 hertz and below. Mm -hmm. um, and usually yeah. because if if you're one over two pi rc if you've got yeah. like ones and tens and hundreds on both the capacitors and the resistors it comes out to 16 times some power of two so that's why 100 puffs 10k 100 puffs 10k is 160 kilohertz right okay yeah. um so i usually end up doing 1.6 hertz yeah is is the value that, that ends up going there so cool that is who makes the stepped attenuators. Uh, I don't know who makes them. I get them on eBay. Um, um, I know, so you can get some uh, some stepped. They're not like they're not that cool though. They're I think that they're wire wound, like just carbon resistor, like uh, stepped. Yeah, but stepped like on box. a on a big um, multi like four pole, forty throw switch rotator ro rotatable switch. No. Rotor switch. That's what that's called. No. Okay. So these are these are basically just rotary pots that are that have like a whole bunch of gra graduated steps. Oh, it's, it's like just got the little. Yeah, that. That's not a step attenuator. Okay. That that. So so okay. So tell me actually tell me more about them then. Because, okay. So like I I just assumed that those were regular step like the stepped pots I guess. The, the, okay. So no, a a stepped pot is just so that it doesn't move around on you. Like yeah. when, when you've got that little click in well, the... Well, and for kind of repeatability, I would guess. Yeah, okay, too. repeatability. Yeah. Yeah. But the tracking between the two different pots yeah. is still subject to the analog var uh, vagaries of yes. how it's smeared that yes. carbon across that particular layer of cardboard, Yeah. right? There are 805... So yeah, resistors. so they're they're individual or, discrete know, resistors yes. inside. Point oh one percent discrete resistors inside here. Yeah, in a ladder. Yeah, and what you're doing is you're is just you're selecting just, which, which pair. One? Yeah, interesting. So, hmm. and so I the, mean, it's it's sort of basically the same thing. It's just a very much more precise way of. Correct. Manufacturing it. Yeah. There's, you're no, using... there's no other electronics going on Correct. inside of there. Okay. Correct. Correct. You're using discrete high precision resistors yeah. between each of your steps instead yes. of a smear of analog right. goo. And so that particular thing is generally called an attenuator versus a potentiometer. Is that... Th this one is called a stepped attenuator. S a yeah. stepped attenuator versus... Yes. Yeah. Stepped I keep pointing at the thing okay. that is right off camera. I know. I do the, so the these time. are stepped okay. attenuators. If you go on to eBay, um, search. I, for, I, I've never had to, you know, use one of these components before, yeah. so I'm not, I'm not familiar with the verbiage used to describe yep. them. Electrically, they are a potentiometer. Right. Okay. You know, uh, on the two outside pins, you've got yep. 10k all the way across, and the sweep, the yep. sweeper just, yep. you know, selects where in the middle of that you're going. Yeah. Um, Brent, if you're looking for them on eBay, look for <laughs> DACT stepped attenuators. <laughs> um, and these are about the same size and pinout and everything as, um, what are they, 20 millimeter pots, dual gang pots. So mm -hmm. they're, they're roughly the same physical form factor as, as a pot that's about that size. Um, yeah. All right. Are there any other cool. questions that we've been missing? I don't think so. Yeah. So that's my cool. audio file stuff. Um, awesome. I so I have redonkulously expensive headphones. Um, <laughs> actually, my favorite headphones right now are are not my most expensive. 
Um, the most expensive. Is headphones. that allowed? Yeah, I know. What, <laughs> what kind of audiophile are you? I'm sorry. <sighs> I've never paid more than a thousand dollars for a pair of headphones, so I'm obviously doing it wrong. Um, I uh, like good audio. So right now, my favorites are um, Great Gravy. What's the brand? 1770s. Um, it's not Audio Technica. I was gonna say I don't know any. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> any, any. Oh my brands, gosh, so. I'm blanking on it. Um, somebody will figure it out. Um, so, what kind of music do you generally like to listen to that you feel like you really need high quality audio to fully appreciate? Um, lots. So, I I listen to um, metal, electronica, uh, acoustic, mm -hmm. uh, classic, classical, uh, classic rock. Um, uh, lots of different things, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Anything that I, I listen to, I think is improved by having good headphones. Yeah. Um, I, I know people who like, who basically like listen to a lot of music with, you know, that's maybe more classical or um, I would say like string focused yep. where you have like a lot of higher frequency yep. tones information yeah. that, yeah, that kind of, Typical run-of-the-mill headphones don't do a very good job of, yes. of replicating. So. Um, yeah, so, so I, was, I was curious if your musical tastes were like more towards that side of things, or whether you just you know all of it. I mean yeah. that stuff too. Um, so th that specifically, they're talking about um, uh, clarity is yeah. the quality of yes. a headphones, and it's basically how quickly can the diaphragm on your headphones react to changes in sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Common headphones are what are called dynamic headphones mm -hmm. and dynamic headphones just look like a speaker, right? Yep. You got a permanent magnet and you got a coil of wire. And when you pass a current through that wire one way, it makes a magnetic field that acts against the permanent magnet and pushes that coil. And then you attach a diaphragm to that coil and it moves pushes the air, air. You pass the current the other direction, it moves the other direction, the air, you know, and it pulls back and you alternate it back and forth and your diaphragm goes like this. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that the coil of wire is massive. Yeah. Uh, as in it has mass, uh, it's heavy and the diaphragms, uh, like on, like on a speaker, the reason you have three different speakers or two different, uh, elements to your speaker is because the big speaker, the woofer yeah. can move a lot of air to make the low frequencies, but it's heavy and it can't respond fast enough. It has too much momentum to be able to reproduce the high frequencies. Mm -hmm. Whereas the things that are light enough and small enough to reproduce the high frequencies aren't big enough to push enough air to re uh, reproduce the low frequencies. Yeah. And so you end and up- So with... that's why you have crossovers. Yep. And so you you take your audio signal and you basically like split it out into two or three different audio signals. Frequency ranges. Which yeah, yeah are all filtered for specific frequency ranges, which are best reproduced by that side. Yep, that's exactly. Bigger. But headphones are just like, well, I don't know. My so, cheap ass headphones are just like one one driver. Yeah, and but so that's okay does, because it's really close work? to your ears. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's really close to your ears. So you don't so... need to move massive amounts of air Correct. for to hear bass. Correct. It's like and right in your ear. And um, because they're relatively small, they can mm -hmm. be very thin uh, and react relatively quickly to produce the high frequencies. Ah, right. Okay. So, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Um, but inexpensive headphones still won't respond very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you end up having to pay a fair bit of money to get the super lightweight ones that mm -hmm. can, that have that fast response. Uh, dynamic headphones, there are good dynamic headphones. In fact, my favorite headphones right now are straight up dynamics. Um, but there are other designs of headphones that are, have lighter weight diaphragms or have the other problem with the, with the standard dynamic, with a cone based dynamic is that you've got that circle that, that is your coil mm -hmm. and it's pushing on that diaphragm in a circle and that makes sense waves out through the diaphragm itself. Ah, right. So and so that distortion. wave you get distortion and, mm. and all kinds of phase effects and things. Um, and so it would be ideal if you could act on the entire surface at once. Same. Yeah. Um, and so there is a style called uh, planar magnetic and mm. a planar magnetic is mm. you have a very lightweight diaphragm mm. that, um, uh, it has a, a kind of a metalized coil, or it's like a, a, a zigzag snake hmm. uh, of, of of a metal contact on that's like 
deposited onto that foil. So it mm -hmm. is, or to the to the uh, mylar is usually what they are, right? Wow. So you have a super very, lightweight. yeah, so you have yeah. a super lightweight diaphragm with this little metalized snake on it. Mm -hmm. And then you put permanent bar magnets ah, okay. on uh, like in front of it and or behind it. Yeah. And uh, when you pass the, and you orient them in a particular way so that when you pass the current, it works against that it's, permanent bar yeah. magnet, but it's operating against the entire thing, mm, right? The entire yeah. surface of the plane, of the plane mm -hmm. is being acted upon by that current. Pretty equally, yeah. Yeah, because current is equal yeah. throughout the entire thing, right? Yeah. You know, the voltages won't be, but the current is. And so it's going to be creating the same it's magnetic like tricky field. tricky to mount because you have to like, it has to be able to move yep. all at once. So you have to like... Mounted on the well, the, the mylar is stretchy like, enough that you, if you just give it enough yeah. of a of a uh, of a surround, yeah, like and, and, and you're not moving much, right? You're you're moving like right, maybe would, a millimeter. Sure, but if it's held on the sides, wouldn't you get like distortion again because your shape is kind of different and your edges won't, aren't going to move as so much as your middle? Probably, but your your surround is that big versus your diaphragm that's that big. Okay, your radiating element, which is that okay. big, right? So the vast majority of of the the radiation is coming from the part that is all moving together okay so that's called a planar magnetic um hmm. the difficulty i won't call it a problem the difficulty with planar magnetics is that they are typically very low impedance you don't have a whole lot of wire running through yep you know you've just got this little metalized snake and so it's yeah. not very long um and because it is like deposited metal on mm -hmm. a mylar it's not a wire yeah right it tends yeah. to be high resistance as well a relatively high resistance which yeah. means that you're just losing efficiency yeah so planar magnetic headphones are both low impedance and low efficiency oh, weird right so huh. like a typical impedance for a planar magnetic is 20 to 30 yeah. some of them are up in the 40 range yeah whereas high impedance for a dynamic microphone would be 300 600 ohms hmm. right so we're talking an order of magnitude the high impedance planers are an order of magnitude lower impedance than your high impedance dynamics. Hmm. Okay. Um, and they're also typically five to 10 dB less efficient. Mm -hmm. So you need to put in, you know, five times, like somewhere between two times and, and 10 times as much power. And in that order, power needs yeah. to be in the form of current. Yes. Not mm, voltage. Not voltage. Yep. Um, yep. So the uh, so a <clears throat> point being the planar magnetics are are typically very difficult to drive. Mm, yeah. If you plug my Hi-Fi Man HE five sixties into mm -hmm. your laptop, for example, they're going to sound like crap. Like, yeah. They okay. are going to sound horrible. Hmm. Um, if you plug them into an amplifier that's not meant for high current mm, devices, they're just going to sound yeah. horrible. Um, Do a lot of them have like separate power supplies then? Like the headphones themselves yeah. don't come with them. No. So you need to build an amplifier for it. Okay. So one of the goals with these amplifiers that I've designed is to be able to drive these low efficiency, low, mm. low impedance headphones. headphones. Um, now, cool. the other side of that is high impedance headphones. I mentioned some yeah. that are 300 ohms, 600 ohms. So if you look at uh, Sennheiser uh, mm -hmm. is kind of the, the big name for people that uh, for high impedance headphones. They've got the HD 600s, the 650s, and their 800 series as well. They're all in the um, need higher current amplifier. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Guaro's just making notes. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so the the like the 600 series and the 800 series by Sennheiser, they are very high impedance. Thankfully, they're also high efficiency. They're usually around 90 to 100 dB. SPL, which is, uh, I'm sorry, over 100 dB SPL, which is pretty efficient. Uh, those uh, planar magnetics that I was talking about are typically in the high 80s or low 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so they're very efficient, which means it doesn't take a lot of power to drive them, but that power needs to be delivered as voltage. So that's why this mm -hmm. has plus and minus 12 volt rails. So I got uh, 24 volts okay. of headroom, whereas typically you're only driving them to, you know, uh, normal headphones are about one to two volts. Mm -hmm. uh, a very high impedance can, you might get up to like six, seven, like at most 10 volts. And you're going to yeah. blow your eardrums out if you're driving your headphones <laughs> at 10 volts. Um, yeah. And um, so uh, so anyway, so the, the goal of these amps was to be able to have a high voltage range to be able to drive high impedance canned mm -hmm. cans and a lot of current to be able to drive low impedance cans. And if you can do both of those things, then you can drive anything in the middle. Hmm. 
And we haven't even started talking about electrostatics. <laughs> well, maybe we should table electrostatics okay. for another time and talk about badges. Badges. Badge life. All right. Because, yeah, badges are super cool. I mean, we we like doing little badges around here. Our badges are more, are, are typically, like, very simple and more kind of, like, beginning soldering kit focused. Um, and... And you know, are just like fun, fun little graphics. I voted <laughs> like that. These are these are one of my. This is one of my favorites, definitely. Yay! I like that one. I that voted. One, that one was a good one. Yep, that's a very <laughs> definitely. Good one. It was our best seller in November. <laughs> yes, I believe I bought two of them. Yay. Um. All right. So badge life. Do we have yes. something dark? We can put this oh, up against because it's yes. a white circuit board. All right. Um. Sure. I. For many years, went to an event called DEF CON. Uh, I haven't been in a couple of years just because my life is kind of going in other directions these days. But I was a regular at an event called DEF CON, which is a hackers convention in Las Vegas. It happens every year. It's been going on for 92, I think was the first one. So a long time. DEF CON 14 changed the world of conventions forever. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. This is yeah. not hyperbole. Um so Joe Grant of Grand Idea Studios, uh, if you've ever seen the TV show Prototype This, do you remember mm, that show? I have not, no. You would enjoy Prototype This. I, I, I recommend you look it up. I think it was Discovery Channel, hmm. something like I, I It was 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Joe Grant was the guy who did all the electronics on Prototype This. Cool. So, but he's been a hacker. Um, loft. Do you remember when a hacker group went to testify to Congress? Some like back in the nineties. Yeah, like vague fuzzy memories. Yeah. So like they they convinced Congress this like the best hack ever. They convinced Congress that they couldn't use their real names. They had to testify under their their handles for for like anonymity reasons and whatever. I mean, best <laughs> hack ever. So they're sitting there. There's a picture of Loft Heavy Industries guys. Um, in their suit and ties at the Congress, mm -hmm. they're they're being totally respectful and everything mm -hmm. else, but they've got like kingpin and you know all, all their different hacker handles in front of them. That's Brilliant. Awesome. Uh, I can't remember the names of some of the other guys, but Joe Grand was one of those guys. Nice. Um, so Joe is an, a wonderful person. Um, I love him to death. He's he's I've met him. Uh, he and I kind of become friends since he started doing this. DefCon fourteen. Mm -hmm. Every year at DEF CON, they had to come up with new ways of making the badge unique and hard to copy. Because in the early mm -hmm. days, they were just laminated cards and people would oh. go out to Kinko's, make co literal copies oh, of them, right, laminate yeah. them and yeah. get into DEF CON for free. Right. I don't know why. It was 20 bucks back in the days, guys. Yeah. Come on. Really? Anyway, uh, I think it's more for doing it for the hack, right? Yeah. Because can you hack them and, and can copy you the hack badge? the hackers? Yeah. Can you hack right. the badge, yeah. right? And so at DEF CON 14, Joe and uh, Jeff, uh, so Kingpin and Dark Tangent. Dark Tangent's the guy who runs DEF CON. Uh, okay. Jeff Moss is his name. Um, they got together and they're like, we want to do something new. Something mm -hmm. that's never been done before. So Joe designed a circuit board with a mm -hmm. little tiny uh, um, pick microcontroller, a little six pin pick microcontroller, nice. a few passives, a coin cell, Mm -hmm. A button that you use to turn it on and off. Let me see mm -hmm. if this battery's still any good. <laughs> we got we got more if, if, if it's not. 2030. Uh, yes, we uh, have ubiquitous 2032. 2032s around here. Um, <laughs> stick them on there. Let's see here. No, yeah, it's not working. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Rob, Robin will give us get us a Robin's new battery. Yes. Okay. Um stick them off your pad anyway so he created this batch mm -hmm. and um it started out as as you know it would uh turn on solid it would blink mm -hmm. and then you had this little random pattern in there mm -hmm. um and uh, i just love the giant leds too they're the, like the 10 millimeter ones or something. yeah <laughs> um and he put out a challenge he's like hack the badge do something cool with it just Anything, just anything, whatever you there, want. no rules, just hack the bag. And if you can impress Joe Grant, then you won the contest. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's positive on the yeah, positive, positive yeah. on top. Yeah, all right, yeah. there we go. Yay. All right, so, um, now we're gonna have to do that. Turn off the lights, yep. <laughs> so solid, then blinky, 
Uh, and then I reprogrammed, uh, then they, it did the <laughs> wigwag, nice, uh, yep. and then I reprogrammed mine to transmit DEF CON 14 in Morse code. So, <laughs> da did it, it, or da did it, it, da did da it, da did da it, da da da, da did, then did it, did it, da, no, did da 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 da, and then did it, did it, da. Anyway, so you so had did, to learn Morse code for your hand. Oh, I, I, I am assuming. Uh, yeah. Hand wave. Uh, <laughs> you don't. You don't anymore. Right. Yeah. You don't anymore. Yeah. Um, but so my hack was that I reprogrammed mm -hmm. the the microcontroller to blink DefCon 14 in Morse code. Nice. Um, but the point being that when Joe created this, this became the standard by which all conference badges for the next decade or more were <laughs> started to, yeah. measured. So everyone started doing electronic badges for their conferences. Yeah. Um, this was the first, this is what started it all. Um, and it says here, well, it says DEF CON, uh, it doesn't actually say human in, on this one anywhere, but the white ones were for humans, the attendees. Okay. And then there are goons who are the security that run it, uh, yeah. green for speakers, um, all, you know, they all have different colors for the nice. different the different types of badges that you have. That was DEFCON 14. I saw this and I fell in love with it and <laughs> um, was super excited by it. A few years later, um, Namni Art, if you're watching the stream, I saw you retweet, retweet my tweet. I don't know if you're in there, but if you are, say <laughs> hi. A guy that I was working with at the time, mm -hmm. his name is Austin. He's Namni Art on uh, Twitter. He came up to my desk one day and just handed me a sheet of paper. And on this sheet of paper was a giant QR code. <clears throat> <laughs> and he just stuck it on my desk and he walked away. <laughs> well, shit, of course I've got to well, scan that thing scan and figure it. out what it is. I mean... <laughs> of course I'm going to. So I got out my phone and I scanned it and um, decoded it. And it turned out it was an RSA private key. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And... Um, and he, his experiment at that point was to see whether I was intrigued enough just by a QR code to scan it and, and look at it and try and figure out what to do. Of course I was. Yeah. And he's like, it's a, I don't know what to do with it yet. Mm -hmm. But he had this idea of starting a um, kind of scavenger hunt hmm. and using this as the trailhead. Okay. Um, and so the two of us started thinking about this and we did an event at the local college. He was still a student. I had, you know, I graduated at that point, 10 or 15, you know, 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. But we uh, did a little scavenger hunt thing where it started out with a QR code. Okay. Uh, the, the big one, this big single one was hard to, um, hard to decode. And so we mm -hmm. cut it up into three blocks. You had one that had the begin RSA block and then mm -hmm. a bunch of random characters, the one in the middle that just had a bunch of random characters. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, which was a bunch of random characters and the end key block. Nice. Okay. And so by scanning these three different QR codes, you could mm -hmm. tell that this was a, a thing that you had to assemble and okay. put together. And on the flyers, we just wrote Alice at slowwhiterabbit.org. <laughs> nice. And then we had a little ASCII art of a white rabbit on it. Uh -huh. And so white rabbit, obviously you've got to chase it. Yeah, right. right? Yep. You have to follow it down the rabbit hole. And um, Alice at slowwhiterabbit.org and you have an RSA private key. What would you do if you saw that? I would go to the website and try to slowwhiterabbit.org uh, as a website. I think it just had some uh, like a, a picture of a rabbit on it. That was just it. that was it. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, Alice. I would I would email it. Okay. I would email it, and yeah. You would get a response, yeah. an automated response that says, "I like the way you think, but you're on the wrong wrong path." Interesting. So, like, it feels like it's credentials for something, right? Yeah. Like it feels like it's a, a username and password yep. combo, essentially. Yep. So where would you, you ever like, use SSH? Log in? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the RSA private key turned out to be a private key to an SSH server. Okay. And if you log in as Alice. So how would you know you don't. where the server is? Or, okay. Slowwhiterabbit.org. Okay. You, yeah. you don't. But okay. the, the goal is to get people thinking about it and yeah. trying a bunch of different things. Okay. And um Anyway, so you, mm -hmm. you log in using this RSA private key as mm -hmm. your authenticator to okay. alice at slowwhiterabbit.org. Yeah. And it would, uh, for the first two weeks that we put this up, it had uh, an, an ASCII art of a white rabbit, <laughs> because of course it does, uh, because we put white rabbits anywhere, everywhere to let you know that you're on the yeah, right okay. track. Okay, right? cool. 
So uh, and then it had the breadcrumbs. And then it printed out three numbers. Mm -hmm. The top one was static. It was a big, okay. uh, I think, nine digit number, like 1.4 or 1.5 million, something, something. Okay. Um, or billion. What I think it's billion. Uh, and then the next one was a slightly smaller number, but the same number of digits. And it was counting up once a second. Okay. And then the third one was a little tiny number, was the difference of those two. Okay. Right. And so these are Unix time, the number of seconds since December 31st or okay. January 1st, midnight, 1970. Okay. Right. So any hacker will recognize these numbers as okay. Unix time. And so the top one was. The, I am not a hacker. <laughs> the top one was the Unix time when an event was going to happen. Okay. The second one yeah. was the current Unix time. time. And, and then, then the third one was just the a difference. Countdown. A countdown. Yeah. A countdown timer. Right. Okay. And so you log in and you're like, oh, okay. Something's going to happen. You take the top number. Yeah. You can you can translate that and figure out when the next thing is going to happen. Okay. And we had a whole bunch of people logged in at the time <laughs> when that happened. And uh, at that point, it was um, I, I can't remember all of the steps anyway. Anyway, it was like, like a, this is a good scavenger hunt. Like, it was it was a lot of yeah. fun. I think what we did next was we just output a couple of uh, a latitude and a longitude. Oh boy. Okay. okay. So now maybe you have to be in a certain place at a certain time. So it became like a geocache, yeah. right? Here's nice. a, here's a Latin long yeah. go there. And it was a spot out in Pauly Canyon where there was a tree mm. and Austin went out there and hung a laminated card with a picture of a white rabbit on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use this a lot, unfortunately, another QR code, mm -hmm. but this one had a, um, another private key that was used to connect into our website. Okay. And so this was a forum. Ah. And, and, and so it was a forum program mm -hmm. and you had to use this private key in your browser to connect to this forum so mm -hmm. that you knew that anybody else that was in this forum mm -hmm. was also playing the game. Got it. Right. So yep. it's a way for us as the ones who are running the game and the players to communicate with each other without actually okay. knowing who each other was. Cool. We yeah. modified the JavaScript. So when you created your account, you would say, you know, give me a username and a password. And yeah. when you type it in and click enter, it would, the cursor would go up to the username, backspace over the name that you put in there <laughs> and assign you a random handle. <laughs> nice. I think we use Greek letters or something like yeah. that. And so everybody had their randomly assigned handles, right. not yeah. their chosen usernames. That's funny. And, and so we, and, and it just went on mm. like every two weeks, we would add a new stage to the scavenger hunt. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Nice. Nice. Fast forward to <laughs> DEF CON. Okay. We, we kind of lost, um, lost the... momentum a little bit on the, um, <laughs> yeah, Unix Epoch so time, time is, is uh, by definition is UTC. Uh, you mm -hmm. apply cool. time, uh, time zones on top of it. When you <laughs> convert from Unix time to a text string, that's when you apply uh, time zone changes. So the number of mm -hmm. seconds is inherently UTC. Um, cool. So we thought about doing this at DEF CON and we mm -hmm. were trying to figure out how yeah. we wanted to do it. I read a book. Can we get the top down view again, please? Um, nice. I had just read a book called um, Demon, D-A-E-M-O-N, mm -hmm. as in the computer program Demon. Yeah. Highly recommended. If you all haven't read Demon and the follow-up, Freedom TM, highly, <laughs> highly, highly recommended. Wonderful books. Absolutely changed my perspective on a lot of different things. The author is Daniel Suarez. Wonderful guy. I have actually have become friends with Daniel after do, doing all the stuff that I'm about ready to describe. Um, anyway, in Demon, um, they create these kind of online <laughs> communities called the Darknet. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, I w what I was trying to do is I was kind of trying to create this virtual online community for DEF CON mm -hmm. called the DEF CON Darknet. Yeah. That's kind of where this started. And in Demon, without spoiling too much, there's like this rampant, or not rampant, but there's this uh, kind of narrow AI that was left behind by a brilliant um a uh, brilliant computer a game designer, a computer scientist. Uh, like he dies in the very first, like the first chapter is mm -hmm. his uh, his obituary, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a secret okay. that this yeah. guy dies. Uh, he dies of brain cancer, but what he left behind is mm -hmm. what the story is. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful book, uh, absolutely wonderful book. I wanted to create the Darknet at DEF CON. Um, and one of the things was like darknet members can uh will know other darknet members and you you recognize each other and you can communicate with each other and whatnot 
And so what I did is, and I, I wanted to use this as kind of the basis for another scavenger hunt um, type thing. And so I, we created, Austin and I created this DEF CON darknet his DEF CON Darknet project. And one of the first things that we had you do in the DEF CON Darknet project was to assemble a kit. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the prototype circuit board of that kit. Nice. Um, yeah, John McGrath agrees. Uh, Damon <laughs> is a wonderful book. Um, nice. And so again, this is kind of where I got into the habit of putting values mm -hmm. on boards because there were no instructions. What I yeah. did is I was trying to remain anonymous, kind of like we did mm -hmm. for the Slow White Rabbit. Um, I was trying to remain anonymous on this and it mm -hmm. didn't last long, but <laughs> I showed up at the Hardware Hacking Village and dropped yeah. off a box. And when you open up the box, there are like a hundred little Ziploc baggies, mm -hmm. not with that circuit board, that was my prototype, but mm -hmm. with that circuit board um, and parts. Nice. So like a board, a little coin cell on the bottom. Okay, I, I am intrigued right now because... Uh, let, me, uh, let me do that one. I don't think I've ever seen a black LED. What is going on there? What is a black? What oh, is a black not... LED? Because I saw black printed on your prototype and I was like, that looks like an LED, but he must be doing like wire colors or something. So what is this? Black LEDs are infrared. Okay. Okay, okay. that makes sense. All right. And uh, the clear LED yeah. is an infrared receiver. <laughs> All right. And then the red LED is just a red LED. Okay. Uh, that's a little AT Tiny 85 nice. microcontroller. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so you got like the 10K there is mm -hmm. a pull up resistor for the reset, reset. I think. Okay. Uh, um, oh, no, pull up for the. Um... Shoot, I don't remember. I think I think it's a pull up for the reset. For the reset, that, that would make um, sense. Yeah. And then you got a couple of the. Um, actually, this is the IR receiver. Uh, because you'll see oh, okay. the arrow pointing in. So, oh, okay, and then that, that, that one's that the, one's IR, the transmitter. IR transmitter. The black is the IR receiver. Yeah, yeah. And then the red one is just a, a LED mm -hmm. for um, mm -hmm. whatever. And so the two current limiting resistors and a microcontroller and a pull up and the IR receiver. Got it. And I'm kind of curious whether this thing is still working. And is that like a little programming header on, a, on the side of it or something? Yes. Oh, it's, it's, it's making some light. It is blinking. It's blinking. So who knows what's actually still in here. <laughs> um, so what this microcontroller does is um, it blinks Morse code and it just blinks, I think, uh, dcdark.net mm, okay. is what I think it uh, blinks repeatedly. Um, and so if you go to HTTPS dcdark.net mm -hmm. um, was the original web page. I think it may still be the web page for the darknet now. Mm -hmm. Darknet's been going on ever since then. I, I've mm -hmm. kind of not been involved with it for many years. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show the progression here in a bit. But the um, the idea was that the, the rules and information and everything was on the website. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would communicate with the demon um, using um, Twitter, actually. Mm, yeah. uh, and so what this did is um, it linked some instructions for you. Oh, I've pissed it off. <laughs> um, it blinks some instructions at you about how to kind of figure out what's going on. There were no assembly instructions, okay. just yeah, component just values and... on the board. So you kind of had to figure it out. Um, so this header, well, one of my proudest moments about this particular board, um, it's a, it can either be a one by four, yeah, uh, which is the standard for the propeller UART to USB adapter. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. So yeah. power, ground, ground, transmit, and receive. Yeah. Um, and um, propeller was the one that made the most common one of those back in the Way back. 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I and so remember that. thankfully, power and ground are in the same place on the propeller one by four as it is on the six pin the two by three ICSP header. header. Nice. Right. So you can either use that as a uh, two by three IC in circuit system programmer. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how you program yeah. these microcontrollers, or you can use it as um, the serial port on uh, a, a propeller. Cool. So if you didn't want to deal with all of the blinking red LED and the Morse code and everything, you could hook up you a propeller adapter to it and it would just squirt it out over serial port. Nice. So what the hell did these things do? The whole point of this is that it periodically beacons Every single one of them was programmed with a unique code, a cryptographically okay. unique code. And we developed a protocol that 
with my unique code and your unique code without sending the codes over the air, mm -hmm. we can use those two codes to generate a third code that is the unique to the pairing of our two badges. Okay. All right. And so if you took that third code that is mm -hmm. unique to the pairing of our two badges mm -hmm. and sent it to the demon, mm -hmm. the demon would be able to verify, cryptographically verify that I met you. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so the idea, and then we would get points for having built up the network. Okay. Right. So the idea was you've gone to the hardware hacking village, you picked yeah. up one of these free learn to solder kits. Yeah. And you've put it together, and now you've got a thing that's blinking Morse code at you, mm -hmm. telling you to go to this web page that tells you what to do with this thing. Okay. And it says, go find other agents. You're building this, this um, darknet hole mm -hmm. on. Uh, go read the books. It'll make a lot more sense. <laughs> You're building this darknet, darknet hole on. And um, I mean, I'm assuming that at some point in time, badge sex has to occur, right? Yes. Like, so you meet your you're 69 you meet the badges your, together your person yep. and and you transmit to your receive and receive to your to your, to your transmit. Here. Exactly right. And that's how you meet somebody. Yes. Right? OK. And cool. uh, uh, and as soon as the, you pair the badges like that, yeah. now it starts blinking that code. Ah, or okay. you can plug it you, into the serial port and it just squirts it out. You send that code like to the, the demon and the demons <laughs> yeah. and the demon says, ah. I can yeah. cryptographically prove that, that your you code, which is held on that chip but never transmitted over infrared, right? Okay. And my cryptographic code, yeah, which is held on my chip but never okay. transmitted over infrared, were put together mm -hmm. and generated this third code. So cool. it's a zero knowledge proof, hmm. and anybody who is sniffing these things can't just magically generate all the codes, so right? What, it what has do to they be a two-way send exchange. over infrared then if they're not sending their codes to each other? We're getting into cryptographic protocol design, and I did this <laughs> 10 years ago, and I don't remember. Okay. Um, it's some knowledge it's is like, public. It's basically kind of a public-private like key hash. Sort of thing yeah, thing. similar to that. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. I'm not using uh, any public key crypto because the keys are too large for that. Okay. So yeah. I say it's cryptographically secure. It would be if I were using longer keys. It's okay. like, it's all 32 bit. It's at tiny 85. Exactly. Yeah. So they're all secure. 32 bit <laughs> numbers, not even, yeah. or maybe, no, it's 64 bit numbers, but you can still brute force the 64 bit number. So you, you can sure. brute force yeah. this. Okay. Um, yeah. But if the key value key sizes were larger, it would be cryptographically mm -hmm. sound. So anyway, okay. and so like in the first year was basically that go meet other agents. Cool. Uh, so that was the first year. Then after the first year, uh, a, a person that became has since become a good friend of mine. His name is uh, Crux um, at Crux on Twitter. Mm -hmm. If you want to follow him, uh, he was one of the people playing the game. He got super excited about it and was was very interested in it. And I contacted him after the event and I said, would you like to help me do it next year? Um, because I want to get bigger and uh, do more with this than just this one little thing. And he jumped on that bandwagon and said, hell yes, I do. <laughs> and so Jeff started designing the badges Dang. for me. And you can tell that this it is got a far step yeah. up from that. Uh, this I was like done. The floppy disk though. This was made one. on uh, Express PCB, mm. right? Like super cheap, and yep. you know. And anyway, and Jeff, that, that's this Park, is when obviously. I learned about Osh Park. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. So this was the second year that we did the DC Dark DC Darknet DefCon Darknet. And again, it was through hole down here. And electrically, this circuit is exactly the same as mm -hmm. this circuit. Okay. So yeah. it's an AT Tiny 85, um, mm -hmm. the three resistors, the three three LEDs, okay. right? And then the same two by three or one by four header. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also uh, added the six pin header up here for mm -hmm. the what was then becoming more common um, oh, like the the UART to USB yeah, cable like, yep. um, sockets. Yep. Um, so you could use any of the different common nice. serial cables. But he also added this serial stuff up okay. here. And it was so we a, got like a, a USB yeah, chip. Like it's an FTDI, FTDI chip. FTDI chip, probably. Yeah, okay. And so yeah. the idea was you would get the badge and everything with all the through hole stuff. And if you mm -hmm. got to the end of the through hole and you're like, that was easy. Is there mm -hmm. any more? He was like, all right. <laughs> here's a surface mount package go try that nice and he made it a challenging one too he it's made it like a tssop package so that thing pitch. that thing was a son of a bitch 
I like I because, couldn't do that without magnification, honestly. Like I, you know, I'm I I would be very competent and proficient at doing that under a microscope, but like at a conference yeah. with maybe like a crappy, you know, magnifier yeah. or ring light. There like, was an awful hard. lot of that's hard. Put a whole lot of solder on there, then give me the solder. solder wick. Wick. <laughs> Yeah, and suck I it hope up from... you brought a lot of solder. Wick. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, there's some LEDs in here somewhere, I think. Um, shoot. No, this is, these are not the LEDs. So that must have been, the... oh, no, they are. They're right there. Oh, no, these right here. Oh. No, so that's... transmitted receipt. Yeah, they're non-populated. Oh, because... RX and TX. I yeah, see. because okay, I think he, he did like 60, 603s. Are those resistors that are upside down? I just want to. Which one? I'm I'm just calling the that white shit one. Out. The, the white. So, yes. No, those are capacitors. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're um, off the hook. Yeah. You're off the hook. No, I'm off the hook. <laughs> um. So anyway, uh, but electrically, this is kind of the same. And I and Jeff also, I'm sorry, Crux also likes uh, putting uh, hiding secrets on mm. his uh, and and kind of crypto challenges and stuff like that. So he added a bunch to this as well. I like the little um, battery kind of board, the acrylic and the... Yeah, he made... Uh, so he Jeff started, I don't know how active he is in the running of it anymore, mm -hmm. a makerspace in Las Vegas uh, that's now out in Henderson called Sin Shop, S-Y-N. Nice. Uh, Sin mm -hmm. City. Yeah. Synchronous. Yeah, anyway. Um, oh, shoot, that's right. Uh, oh, it's covered by the battery. It's covered, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can see Arr. some like random characters sticking out on the yeah. side there. Um, yeah. There's like a, a cryptographic challenge in there that you nice. you have, you get to do. Anyway, so we we went a lot farther with the puzzles and mm -hmm. uh, teaching people new skills and whatnot. So was there a prize for people who like? Was there an end for people to get to, and was there a prize for people that got to the end? So we we never brought our own prize. Okay, but I can't remember whether it was that year. Or whether it was this year. <laughs> Super size. Yeah, we got to zoom out a bit. I know, right? Can you zoom out a little yeah. bit? I can't remember. It was one of these Other two way. years Other that way. we got so popular yeah. and we caught the notice of Dark Tangent and Joe Grand and Lost mm -hmm. and various other people that run DEF CON that they decided that the Darknet was a black badge contest. Uh, so no. DEF CON has badges yeah we've talked about the white badge which mm -hmm. are humans mortals you know standard mortals right when you go and you pay and you buy a ticket to get into defcon you get a white badge mm -hmm. you, you get a human badge okay um black badges mm -hmm. are for they're called uber badges and they are for people like dark tangent <laughs> uh the guy who runs defcon and sure. joe grand or lost the people who are designed the badges mm -hmm. black badges are handed out to the winners of certain contests mm. so there's one particular contest that's been going on forever at defcon called capture the flag ctf okay um i don't know if defcon started the concept of ctf but basically you got a bunch of teams and you're running systems and you are graded on how what the uptime of your services are. Mm -hmm. You need to run a particular service and it needs to be up and you get, like if your service goes down for whatever reason, you get, you lose points for that. But when it's up, you get, you gain points. Mm -hmm. And you are also attacking all of the other team's services yeah. and they are attacking, attacking your you. services, yeah. right? And so the idea is that you want to get your flag onto the other team's server or mm -hmm. get their private flag from their server. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so it's this uh, like literal capture the flag style game done by hacking computers. Mm -hmm. It's been one of the big central attractions to DEF CON for as long as I've been going. Uh, my first was DEF CON 5. And uh, the CTF organization always gets black badges. And mm. what a black badge gets you, aside from bragging rights. I was just going to say, it sounds like serious bragging rights. Because they are yeah. rare. Yeah. They are not handed out willy nilly. They get you entry into DEF CON for life. Oh, wow. That's fancy. Right. And there are probably Dang. only a few hundred black badges in existence. Yeah. And most of those hundred go, to, several hundred go into or go to CTF winners. Mm -hmm. But occasionally they'll pick other contests that are, um, uh, that are doing really well that year, and they'll mm -hmm. make those contests a black badge contest. Ooh. The thing that I that I did with the darknet that I think got the attention is the goals of the darknet were threefold. 
I want to get people to learn a skill they would not have otherwise learned, mm -hmm. to meet people they would not have otherwise met, and to do things they would not have otherwise done. I like it. So, so many of the contests at DEF CON are about showing how elite you are, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So they are for people who are already really good at a thing, yeah. right? And uh, they're very difficult and they're challenging. Uh, and it's not that you can't do these contests if you've never done it before, but you're definitely got a higher, you've got, you've got a longer hill to climb, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wanted to start something for noobs, specifically nice. targeted at noobs, people who don't have the skills, uh, but you are given the opportunity and the instruction on how to learn that skill, and then mm -hmm. you go off and do it. Yeah. So, like soldering was kind of one of the first ones we did because I'm a hardware guy. You're 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 a pro enabler, by the way. Uh, I, I have to tell people that he's the one that told me I should learn to program with Arduinos like seven years ago or something. Like what that. were you doing before that? Was it Pick? No, or I wasn't was... doing anything before that. I was solely hardware. Oh. I was solely hardware. I hadn't done any embedded programming. Okay. And I like called you up and I was like, yo, Mark, like, what should I, I want, I need to learn embedded programming because I have this crazy idea for like a yarn controlling machine. What? That'll never go anywhere. I know that'll never go anywhere. And so, well, that one didn't, but the next one did. And so, <laughs> and, and I was like, what, like, there are so many processors out there. Like, what do I choose? Where do I start? And you're just like, you should just start with Arduino. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the online about it. There's a ton of learning material yep. and like, and yeah, well now it's 18 yeah. mega 328, baby. Yep. That's nice. what that is. Nice. Um, yeah. So, uh, but it, the, so like one of the other challenges that we did is that we set up a uh, web 40 protected hotspot. Ooh. So like totally okay. weak encryption yeah. on, on the, on the <laughs> Wi-Fi side, like totally crackable. You should never use this kind of thing. Like most access points have removed support for Web40 because nice. nobody should be using it. It's literally crackable <laughs> in seconds on a modern computer. And we set this up and it was break into this Wi-Fi network. Yeah. And so we nice. taught people how to break into Wi-Fi. And then once you're That's on awesome. the Wi-Fi network, you sniff the traffic and you look at the traffic going across mm -hmm. and you get the credentials out of the FTP, the unprotected FTP and <laughs> log into the server and do, you know, so I was like this kind of this. That's cool. Yeah. I, this, like, I would totally be down for that because I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. But so. we started with the assumption of zero knowledge. Yeah. And we, and we bring you up to speed on the different skills and whatnot. That was the whole goal behind the darknet. Cool. And I think that really resonated with uh, the folks that were running it. So Jeff and, and whoever else. And um, and so we got a black badge. We became mm -hmm. a black badge contest for several years. I am responsible for lots of people <laughs> getting black badges, <laughs> but I have never gotten one myself. Aww. I do not have my own black badge. I was kind of, I'm mildly upset, but <laughs> honestly, I, I think I would rather get other people Feel, black badges and yeah. not have my own than have my own and not have done the things that I've done to get other people yeah. black badges. Legit. So because you can get more than one person a black badge, well, whereas you yourself, I assume, are limited at one black badge. No, actually, no. there are a lot of people that have multiple no, black multiple? badges. Oh, yeah. Well, never yeah. Mind. <laughs> um, so in any case, this is all the DEF CON stuff. After this year, um, DEF CON, or mm -hmm. DEF CON Darknet project has been going on continuously since 2011 or whatever the year is on these things. So we've been going on for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of dropped out of it for various different reasons right around this year. I think it was the year after this that I kind of phoned it in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is the last badge design that I had my hand in. So this is, uh, we upgraded from the AT Tiny to a 328, so the AT Mega. So this is full on Arduino compatible. Cool. Uh, we've got all the hardware in there to make this an Arduino. The, mm -hmm. the USB uh, is bit banged. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It is bit banged USB nice. from the AT uh, AT Mega 328. Uh, the programming headers are still over here. Um, the diode, the diode pair here, the the big. Um, it's not an SO or a uh, TO, TO 220, yeah. but it's a soft surface mount, yeah. but not really surface mount. Anyway, whatever that package is. Um, uh, is just merging power between the battery pack on the back and the power coming in from the USB oh, okay. or from the uh, either from USB or from the socket here. Yeah. But otherwise, it's the same infrared communication. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll also note that we put these headers on the side that are just basically straight pin matches for the microcontroller. Mm -hmm. And so there are there's a lot more on the microcontroller than what we're using. Mm -hmm. on this badge. Right. So the idea was that you can take this badge home and use it to do other things. Cool. So it is a full on Arduino compatible yeah. microcontroller nice. on the badge that you got. So you get to nice. take it home and do more with it. 
That hack header it, the idea is one that Jeff uh, Crux came up with that I have put on every single badge, <laughs> every single project I've made since then. I love that idea mm -hmm. uh, because now it's not just this. Yeah. Yeah. You can use, you can use, use it, it to do whatever you want. Yes. I love that idea. Yes. That's so, kind of why I, I did that with the F unicorn. I put like a shield pattern on it for people to yeah. be able to like hook up different sensors or do whatever they want. Yeah. Now you have it like, yes, you have a potty mouthed unicorn that you can use to tell people off, but you also have an Arduino that you can kind of do other stuff with too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, th this is kind of where my, my involvement in Darknet ended. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, just, my life was going in different directions. Yeah. They have continued it on and have done wonderful things with it. So, um, so yeah, cool. I love it. Uh, but that is not the last but no, I did with badges. You still, you still carried on. Starting in 2016, I'm going to hold this up yeah. here because another not. mad shout out to Philip Schumann, uh, <laughs> Schumann projects at Schumann projects on both Twitter and YouTube. The same nice. guy that made this wooden case for the uh, headphone amplifier. He made this display panel for uh, the badge work that I had done at uh, my employer. So I used to work for Amazon up until very recently, actually. Uh, I left just about a month ago. Um, and Amazon had an internal security conference called ZonCon, as an Amazon con, kind of like DEF CON. Get it? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> I like how it kind of, it, I don't know, ZonCon feels to me like it should be a conference of zombies for some reason. <laughs> like, like I know it's not ZomCon, but it's like <laughs> zoned out or like ZonCon. Like. <laughs> so anyway, ZonCon was a conference. And the first conference that we went to was 2015. It was the first one they held. Uh, and the only reason I know that is because it was at the second conference that I talked my managers into giving me a budget to start a Ooh, hardware hacking village. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see here. Nate, let's see how Let far me, we can. Whoop, other way. Other way. And I'm oh, going to yeah. move these out of the way so I can we move got, it around we and got center. Plenty it. of range here. So I talked them, talked my management into letting me do a hardware hacking village at ZonCon. So let's go ahead and zoom back zoom in, in and I'll just move this around. Yeah, sure. Um, so like for one. Yep. Okay, cool. So the first one I did was this one. Look familiar? <laughs> it does. Looks very similar <laughs> to this one, actually. But plus the eyeballs of the original. Plus the eyeballs, yeah. yes. So again, it's an 18 Mega 328 with the hack headers on the side. Um, little crystal resonator there for uh, frequency regulation and programming headers and infrared mm -hmm. transmitter and receiver and you know a lot of the same stuff from the um, the darknet badge. These are WS twenty eight twelves. Oh, so these are uh, individually addressable L RGB LEDs. Holy shit! And uh, the output of the second one is actually available uh, on this header. Can can we look at the back of those? No, not really, yeah. huh? So it, little... they are four pins, 0. 0.05 inch spaced. 0. 0.05. So twice so as dense little, as so a standard point Yeah, 50 one. mils. Yeah. So yeah, like, okay, so a little harder to solder, more like the RGB LEDs that have like the four yeah. the ones that are next to each other. Yeah. Darn, I feel like there's so much space for that that like you could have... Because I think they use the it. same guts yeah. on a on a five millimeter or the eight millimeters, yeah. whatever the small ones are. Yeah. Oh, that makes um, sense. But again, the same IR transmitter and receiver. Yeah. But we did a different game with it. So this one, what we were trying to do is we were trying to get the attendees of the conference to interact with people from security. Right. Oh, and so okay. as an attendee at the conference, you could go to the hardware hacking village, get one of these mm -hmm. kits. They're free. Mm -hmm. The company paid for them. Nice. You sit down. We teach you how to solder it. You solder it all together. And the LEDs start blinking. Mm -hmm. kind of doing this like blue to cyan kind of pulsing heartbeat kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And occasionally somebody would come down with a virus. Keep in mind, this is 2016, mm -hmm. not 2020. <laughs> I was, was early by about no four years. <laughs> yeah. And ever occasionally you would come down with a virus and it would start going over to red and get like this angry kind of red and yellow, orange, blinky, pulsing stuff. Mm -hmm. And over time, you would kind of recover, okay. right? You would All kind right. of recover on your own, yeah. like we do with most viruses. Yeah. But if you are around anyone else who also had a badge, when mm -hmm. your virus was active, it would be transmitting on the infrared and anybody else that was around that had one of these badges would also get sick oh, from you. Interesting. And so you could pass your virus to other people in the conference that were wearing these badges. And you would kind of watch oh. the badges go red and like move through the crowd of people. It was actually kind of cool. 
Interesting. And so just, just to note, so the, the IR receiver on this one is oriented in a way that, uh, that is you, less directional. So it has a broader view when you're wearing it. Correct. Right? So, like, we, so we, you don't have to be like right correct. up against yeah. somebody else. That's yeah. Cool. So when you're wearing huh. it on a lanyard, the IR receiver is forward. Yeah. Both the IR receiver and the, and the transmitter are forward facing. Yeah. That's so, cool. so you, you would, uh, you know, you could pass viruses back and forth, mm -hmm. but this is a security conference mm. and security people are mm. good at avoiding viruses, right? Mm. Yeah. So I pre-made a bunch of surface mount versions, roughly the same hardware, um, but I pre-made it because I'm not expecting everybody who works in security to go sit down at the hardware hacking village and assemble sure. their own. Yeah. So I pre-made pre -made a bunch of them and just handed them out to the folks in security. Mm -hmm. And if you had a meaningful conversation Whatever that meant. That was totally open to discussion or to, to discretion. Uh -huh. If you had a meaningful conversation with someone from security, they could inoculate your badge. Or oh. nowadays, I would say vaccinate Vaccinated your badge. You. Yes. And the idea was that the, um, the security person would uh, transmit a code that vaccinated your badge. And now mm. it would go back and forth between blue and green. Ooh. And you wouldn't catch a virus anymore. So now would it, so would it be both a cure and a vaccination? Like if you were already transmitting the virus, would it, would it cure you? Or you is it just if you're not transmitting the virus that you wouldn't be able to? I can't remember uh, whether you, whether it cured you. You're only at wherever infected for like a minute or two minutes, okay. right? So it Very, wasn't a super long short. time. Okay. Um, I can't remember whether, I think it did abort if you were in the middle of a virus, uh, very whistly. Sorry. <laughs> if you're in the middle of a virus cycle, it would abort, abort. that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but so anyway, the point being that th these two nice. together were designed to encourage interaction between attendees to the conference mm -hmm. and security who was putting on the conference. Mm -hmm. So the InfoSec org was putting on the conference to try mm -hmm. and encourage people to be, you know, to get involved in security and whatnot. Right. So that so this was the first Zoncon that we did. Cool. The reception to this was so amazingly positive <laughs> that like I had to convince people to give me a budget of a thousand dollars to do this. Do and they're like, I don't know, Mark. By the you know, time we're Amazon, we don't have a lot of money. But it was like I, <laughs> what what benefit do we get by teaching people how to solder? Right. Right. Yeah, how is yeah. how is that security related? Right. And I can understand that question. And and I sold it with the you know. People don't think about hardware. We're mostly yeah. a software company. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, it's a software company. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of want people to think about the atoms that their bits are running on, right? Like you, yeah. you tend to be an atom person or yeah. a bit person. Um, and uh, like, I want to cross pollinate. That was kind of the argument that I used to sell yeah. it. After we were done, I think this is the one that got the most positive response of any of the things that were at Zoncon. Nice. And so they're like, please come back and do more. We'll give you more money. Do you have any other cool ideas? And so the other cool idea I had was this one. Mm -hmm. So this was the second badge I did. So Ooh. I upgraded from the 328 to an ESP 8266. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the okay. little yeah. eight pin ESP chips. Uh, it's got Wi-Fi built into it. Um, and it has like two GPIO pins, mm -hmm. but those two GPIO pins were enough to drive a, uh, SSD 1306, mm -hmm. the little 128 by 64 OLED screens, nice. right? Because yeah. it, it can do software. Those are like a dollar or two or yeah, something. Yeah. Right? The super yeah. Cheap like ones. super cheap. Yeah. Um, I, I like how you, like you haven't third... taken your protective coating off of it. I'm a, I'm a peeler. Take it off, baby. <laughs> I know some people are compulsive about that, about like never taking the thing off. Yeah, and I'm compulsive I'm the other way. I'm yeah. just like, this shit's got to go. <laughs> I had literally hundreds of these things. Nice. Um, anyway, I can't remember exactly what the GPIOs are because it took, there are two pins that are shared between I squared C and USB mm. or uh, uh, UART. Oh, it can do yeah. one or the other. Okay. It can't do both, both at, at the, the same, same time. time. And uh, I, th I think you had to like reboot it to get it to switch back and forth. Mm. Um, and, but I also had a pin that was available for WS 2812s. Nice. Um, so the I squared C display and the 2812s were all mm. controlled from this thing. And, um, 
and then a, I guess a couple of, and, a, and a button as well. So I, I guess it has to have four yeah. GPIO pins. Yeah. I think two serial pins and two GPIO is what it is. Mm. So one of the GPIOs goes to the 2812s and the other one goes to the button. Okay. And this one is a Wi-Fi scanner. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a little ESP, 80, or yeah, ESP8266, and it's looking for suspicious Wi-Fi activity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so what it would do is it would look at all of the SSIDs mm -hmm. that it could hear. Okay. And it would sort them by uh, receive signal strength, RSSI. Okay. Yep. And it would give you, it would print out the SSID, mm -hmm. the... Um, uh, the RSSI, so mm -hmm. however many minus dBm it was receiving the signal strength, and what channel it was on, yeah. and it would display the six of the the six top of those on the screen. Mm -hmm. And so no matter where you're at, it will just sit there and tell you what are the local Wi-Fi hotspots. Cool, right? So it's kind of useful for yeah. finding. But right. we we sold it to uh, the game was looking for suspicious activity right. at the company. Yeah. And so if we're going to give you something that's detecting suspicious activity, of course, I'm going to give you some suspicious this activity, activity to, to detect. detect. Yes, exactly. Yes. So um, on the other side of the conference from where the hardware hacking village was, where all the soldering irons were set up, mm -hmm. I made um, using what was it, the nine dollar chip computer. Do you remember those? Mm -mm, no. It was a, it was a Kickstarter Huh. Well, I guess huh. 2016 probably because <laughs> this is a 2017 date and I had already okay. gotten it. But um, think of it like a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. It's very similar to a Raspberry Pi and yeah. it had Wi-Fi built into it. And I figured out how to put them into access point mode. Okay. All yeah. right. So I made an access point that was totally not suspicious <laughs> is the SSID. Um, nice. And uh, again, I did the same thing with the Wi-Fi where I set it up for Web40. Okay. <laughs> um, and so it's it's got the Wi-Fi hotspot mm. and um, a client. There was another another chip that was in the same box that was a client, and it was connected to the web and it was doing file transfers, mm -hmm. and that gave it enough traffic that you could actually de um, crack the key. You could connect mm -hmm. into the Wi-Fi. You could sniff that traffic. It was using unsecured FTP. You would get the credentials out of that unsecured FTP, mm -hmm. log into the FTP server, and there was the totally not suspicious. Uh, break into Amazon plans. And it was like nice. the, the bad guys right. plans. Right. And so you got the bad guys plans and you sent it off okay. to an email address and um, you got a phone tool icon, which is the, right. the currency of the realm at Amazon. Uh, if okay. you want to get people to do things, you offer it them. It is a, the, the black badge. Yes. Of Amazon, yes. Essentially. Okay. Uh, if you want to get people to do things, you offer them a phone tool icon. Got it. Okay. And so you got a phone tool icon for catching the totally not suspicious activity. Nice. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then this is just a little um, UART to USB serial adapter. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you would program the thing. Okay. Yeah. So nice. that was what we did in 27, uh, 2017. That got a huge positive response as well. So nice. we, we, we had a lot of fun with that one. Um, oh, I, I forgot that point. So whenever this microcontroller saw... Um, the totally not suspicious SSID, mm -hmm. it would start blinking madly. Red yeah. and blue. <laughs> <laughs> warning, warning, warning. Right. And it told you to nice. go to a wiki page uh, inside Amazon with instructions on how huh. to how nice. to uh, investigate the Wi-Fi spot that it found. Awesome. Um, I think is it that one. I think it's the next one that I did. The, the thing that I'm probably most proud of that I'll talk about in a second. OK, so this was 2018. This mm -hmm. was my third year doing badges for Zoncon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually have the module. I don't think it was this exact module, but it looked very similar to this. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put this one on here just for an aesthetic comparison. Um, it looked like that. So um, this one used an ESP8266 again mm -hmm. uh, with a little OLED display built into it. So this nice. is a single module with the ESP, the OLED, and the USB all on a single module. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has a whole bunch more GPIO, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, but if you look at the circuit up top here, this is a hardware random number generator, <laughs> like full on quantum entropy. So what it All is, right. is you got that transistors, capacitors, resistors, and an inductor, inductor and diode. So All the right. inductor, a diode, and one of the two cans and one of the transistors, uh -huh. all of that together makes a charge pump controller. Okay. So it takes the 3.3 volts, or actually, I think the 4.5 of the battery pack. Pumps it up to about 15 volts. Okay. The oscillator for that is a PWM coming out of the microcontroller. Okay. So the microcontroller is pulsing this thing, mm -hmm. which generates a 15 volt uh, signal or supply. Mm -hmm. You send that 15 volts into a reverse biased PN junction. Okay. So I'm using a transistor here because yeah. you could also use a diode. Okay. 
But so you reverse bias a PN junction and put it into avalanche breakdown. Okay. Yeah. And when you put it into avalanche breakdown, the transition of electrons across that junction at the quantum level is random. Huh. Okay. I don't ask me to explain how avalanche breakdown is random. Uh, yeah. There's the internet for that. Go figure <laughs> it out on your own. Yeah. But it, you huh. get quantum noise, full on quantum noise. Interesting. And it shows up at the base of that transistor as an electric signal. Okay. Right. Just, yeah. Yeah. Electrons just, randomly just going random across this thing. Signal. Sure. Yeah. The other two transistors are amplifiers. Okay. Turn and amplify that analog noise signal mm -hmm. into roughly full scale to feed into the analog read pin on the microcontroller. Okay. Yeah. So we've got hardware quantum scale entropy coming from a reverse bias transistor going into mm. the microcontroller, which is running. Let me straighten up my bow tie. Um, <laughs> NIST. SP800-90A deterministic random bit generator or 90A compliant DRBG. Uh, basically, if you are going to make a random number generator yeah. that you want to sell to anybody, mm -hmm. that is the specification you use for mm -hmm. how do I take my raw physical entropy and turn it into actually usable random numbers. So, okay, yeah. How do I how do I take my miscellaneous voltage that my microprocessor is reading and turn it into some giant array, I assume? I, I, well, actually, no, you want it to be smaller small? than what's coming in. Yeah. Okay. So All because right. the yeah. signal that's not that's coming yeah. in is not hundred percent dense. Right. Right. Okay. So for every bit yeah. you're reading in, you're not actually getting a full bed of entropy. Okay. Um, SP800-90A is designed mm -hmm. for um, like tiny amounts of entropy okay. per bit. Okay. Uh, and so it pools all of that together in a cryptographically non-reversible way mm -hmm. um, and turns that into actually good randomness. Okay. There's a guy, a good friend of mine named Josh, he is at FNAR, E-F-N-A-R on Twitter. That is literally his day job. He <laughs> has a PhD <laughs> in entropy Indeed. and randomness yeah. and whatnot. And he's been one of my best friends since college. And so he and I worked together on the design of this. Cool. Um, and he's like, you're not going to be able to sell this, <laughs> but what you have is pretty damn good. <laughs> and uh, he nice. ran it through some of his tools to measure the entropy. And he's like, yeah, this is way better than most of the designs that people pay <laughs> me to analyze. Uh, so anyway, really good random numbers. Cool. The, the question is, what do you do with random numbers yeah. on a badge like this? Um, I would use them to like create keys or something, right? Well, like, that's so right. trying to pull it out. I know. Um, Oh. Uh oh, there are Zoncon badges from an internal. These are, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. they are. Uh... <laughs> Just like a few minutes, a few minutes gone, and now it's like it's crazy. crazy. Come back to transistors and quantum noise. Not sad about y'all going deep. That's right. Nice. So, Jeff, uh, hit me up if you want to go in on this, or you can just watch the replay. But actual hardware, like quantum based hardware random number generator. But what do you do with that entropy? Well, you can feed it out through the USB port into your computer. And on Linux, there's a program called RNGD, okay. Random Number Generator Denier. Demon. Okay. And one of its tasks is to take entropy from an outside source and feed it into your kernel's entropy mm -hmm. pool. And okay. so normally on a, Linux, on a Unix machine, mm -hmm. when you say, I need a random number, you go to the kernel and say, mm -hmm. give me a random number. Yeah. And the kernel does its thing to try and uh, Im keep a bunch of entropy that it gets from the system or hardware right. or whatever else. And so this can feed entropy into that kernel okay. entropy pool, right? That's kind of its primary purpose, but that's boring. You can't really do that. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on, Carrie. I know. I know. Oh. I, it's been bugging me. It's, oh, baby. God, oh, you gotta yeah. feel it. You Take gotta it feel off. it. Sorry. It's not that kind of a live stream. Oh, Jeez. sorry. You said we could cuss. I kind of I assumed. Said cuss. <laughs> anyway, but that's boring. You can't do that on a badge while you're wearing it around. So obviously on the display, um, we gave you an option to do a bunch of things with random numbers. What would you do with random numbers? Well, of course, you got to make a dice roller. Oh, sure. Yeah, so yeah, there, yeah. there's a yeah. dice roller on there. Yeah. You can okay. roll, um, roll some dice. Yeah, D20 or D6. Um, so there's a dice roller on there. We made a password generator. Oh, so you just hit a yep. button and it generates it's random password. passwords. Yep. Um, are you familiar with the lava lamp project that SGI did back in the 90s? No. So in the early days of trying to create randomness in, in computers, I think it was SGI, they 
pointed a camera at a lava lamp, lamp I like and it. used that as the entropy source to a DRBG, the, the same kind of algorithm <laughs> that I told you about that we implemented yeah. here. And they use that for generating their entropy for their uh, like key, key generation and whatnot. Yeah. So they were using a lava lamp to generate random numbers. <laughs> of course, I had to use random numbers to generate a lava, lava lamp. lamp. Yeah. That so makes sense. one of the things I programmed in here was a lava lamp animation. <laughs> And so you just got the little bubbles, you know, nice. bloop, 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 bubbling up and bubbling down and whatnot. And it would use the entropy from the thing to Excellent. use the random numbers. Um, I also have a little ASCII art or oh, um, yeah. line art of a lava there lamp is, on yeah. the badge. Yeah, yeah. And if you look underneath oh, ah, oh, okay. with the clips, yeah. you can see it. Yeah. There's a WS2812 mounted upside down. Oh, nice. So that you get the backlit. Yes. Glow. And so nice. you, I don't know if you can see it, but there, there are little mm -hmm. bubbles yep. where the yep. solder mask is removed. Yep. And so you get the thing yep. and it, it randomizes the colors nice. underneath there. Nice. Um, again, we've got our hack headers, which I mm -hmm. put on every single thing I do now. Yep. Nice. Um, oh, I guess I lied. I didn't put any hack headers on this one. <gasps> oh, I'm a failure. <laughs> um, anyway, so the random number generator on here was actually one of my favorite ones. That's I, cool. I think we did. Yeah. I think I did a really cool one with that because nice. it's a lot of passives. So you really get experience soldering a lot of different things. So was there a contest part of this one? Uh, or was it just a yes? Well, yeah, what, what was the not really a contest? It was or, more of an Easter egg. Uh, yeah, it was there like a challenge. Part. So there was like a menu of all the different things you get to do with the mm -hmm. entropy. And if you go down to the bottom mm -hmm. of the menu, there was I, I think you like scroll off the screen. It wasn't immediately obvious that it was there, oh, but if you scroll off the screen yeah. and go to the next one, there's one that just says GRU, okay. G R U E. <laughs> okay. And when you select it, it would print a link to our internal wiki. <laughs> okay. That was yeah. HHV 2017 slash GRU. Yeah. And you go to that wiki page. I am most proud of this document of any document I've ever written. <laughs> it is a wiki page that describes how to install Zork <laughs> on <Yes>. this microcontroller. <laughs> written as a text adventure. That's That's amazing. Like started out, you yeah. are in the hardware uh, hacking village. Awesome. You think there is much adventure here, yes. and, you know, and and it yeah. went through and and with with the complete with the, um, you know, the the you, s you screw up the syntax. What, what? you know, and yeah. all of the, uh, like just all of it. I was so proud of that document. Anyway, I I, I grabbed a copy of it before I left the. Conference. Um. Anyway, so the the Easter egg on this one was that you can install Zork on it. You nice. can't actually play it from the badge itself, but yeah. if you hook it up uh, to a terminal emulator over nice. serial port, and so I you could play try. Zork on the badge. Cool. Super proud of that one. Cool, cool. And then the next year, uh, I know we're way the f. We, over. we are. We're, we're breaking our rules. That's okay. Um, the next year, I did. Um, I actually had a friend of mine help me out with this one, um, John Desanti. I don't know if he's on Twitter. I don't. I don't see him in much anymore but um so it is the same module or mm -hmm. very similar module up here uh and this one was an rfid detector mm -hmm. so the idea is we've got these credit cards that are all yeah. uh, rfid and whatnot mm -hmm. um and we carry them around in the little foil packages oh right yeah you know yeah, I've got my wall, my credit cards in. Uh, where is it? Yeah. There we go. Like these little things here. Yeah, I just hold it up to that camera. There we go. Like these little mm -hmm. things. How paranoid are we that we're doing this? <laughs> is it really justified to right. be that paranoid? Oh, yeah, like the yeah. idea is that I'm just walking around the street mm -hmm. or in a crowded area or whatever, and yeah. someone can bump up against me with a right. with a reader. Yeah. and charge my credit card yeah. or track that I've that I was there right yeah. it could be an RFID tag and, and just kind of follow me or mm -hmm. you walk through a doorway in a shopping center like yeah. are they sh tracking you as you go through right yeah. or airports or whatever like and so the paranoid among us are like I don't want I want to shield all these things I don't want anybody yeah. to just be able to track me on that how paranoid are we being and so what this does is it detects the energy that activates an RFID tag Ah, interesting. Right. Okay. So yeah. if you were to take this yeah. and walk up to a door badge reader and go bloop up against yeah. the badge reader, this would be able to detect yeah. that energy. Yep. And the idea with this is that you would carry this around in your backpack mm -hmm. and the microcontroller, which this is the one that this actually mm -hmm. went to. So let's put it back on here. 
uh, the microcontroller it has Bluetooth on it. So this is an ESP32, mm -hmm. not okay. an 8266. And it has Bluetooth. And you would pair it with your phone. And there yeah. was an app that we wrote that you would install on your phone mm -hmm. that would send you a notification whenever this detected RFID energy. Mm, okay. Okay. And so you would just carry this around in your backpack mm. and it would be quiet most of the time. But if it ever detected RFID energy, it would Bluetooth to your phone and send mm -hmm. you a notification and I would get a little bip on my watch. Mm -hmm. Right. Nice. Uh, that was the idea. It didn't work very well. <laughs> um, kind of, like it worked as long as everything was in the foreground. Okay, right. But yeah. as soon as things went into the background, it kind of lost track of things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but it would work on uh, both the high frequency and low frequency RFID stuff, which are all the common ones for the tags. Nice. Um, and then we also uh, did the surface mount, the same hardware random number generator uh, was kind of an extra part that you could do oh, cool. with all surface mount. Oh, that's nice. the one thing I forgot to talk about on this one. I laid out the board on this so that it would work either with through hole components or mm -hmm. surface mount components. If you look ah. carefully, each one of those through hole outlines has a surface mount outline underneath it. Okay. I was wondering what the extra pads were around the transistors. That makes yes. sense now. Okay. So the idea being that you could go up and say, I'm a noob. I don't know. I'm, I'm just right. learning. Great. Here's the through hole component stuff. Yeah. Or no, I've, I've, I've been soldering my entire life. Give me a yeah. challenge. Or I'm a noob, but I want a challenge, whatever, yeah. you know, whatever you wanted to do. And we would either give you a bag of surface mount parts or a bag of through hole parts. Nice. So um, one board we could do either one. So yeah. that was pretty cool. That was the last, this was the last song mm -hmm. that we did. So this yeah. was 28, 2019. No, 2019. Yeah. Uh, 2020 COVID. didn't happen. Yeah. 2021 has didn't yeah. happen. And I've left the company now. So mm -hmm. these are all of the Zoncon badges that are going to happen, or at least by my design. <laughs> cool. So those that are is, rad. that is my badge life life. Those are super, those are super cool. What super am I? Super duper cool. How many of these, like, did you like give out per conference? How many so people the, were in the games and stuff? The first year, I think we gave out, I made a hundred of the pre-made ones. And I think mm -hmm. we gave out a hundred of these. Okay. Um, because that was kind of what my budget was. Yeah. The yeah, next yeah. year, I think we went up to, I think there were like 250 of these. Nice. And then by the time we got to these, we were yeah. doing like 400, 500 kits. Nice. Um, yeah. I think I made 500 of the base kit, which had all the common parts, the mm -hmm. board, the batteries, the the headers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then I think I did 300 of each of the through hole and surface mount mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure what that balance was going to be. Yeah. Turned out to be about even. Uh, so it was about half and half. Uh, and nice. then I think, again, we did another 500 of these. Cool. Um, so, yeah, you know, there are thousands yeah. of these things out there. That's cool. That's super cool. And then Philip made this panel uh, before he learned that the, <laughs> right, the, the 2019 RFID. badge was going to be longer. <laughs> so it doesn't fit. <laughs> Oh, but, that's okay. It can stick out. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and then, of course, we got custom lanyards as well. So I got a bunch nice. of the different Zoncon Hardware Hacking Village lanyards in there. <laughs> cool. So that's my that's badge awesome. life life. I love it. I love it. So most of my so... making stuff is amateur radio, audiophile, or this kind of badge life stuff. Any any future badge life things that you're noodling about once of course we can get together yeah. and you know have uh, conferences and stuff the uh yes so mm -hmm. the ham radio workbench podcast that i'm a regular on mm -hmm. uh actually i guess technically i'm officially a host now <laughs> um there is a ham radio <clears throat> excuse me there is a ham radio event of almost every year um, aside from covid uh called um Dayton Hamvention. It's actually not in Dayton anymore. It's right outside Dayton in a town called Xenia, Ohio, um, but still Dayton. And it's the kind of the largest gathering or one of the largest gatherings of amateur radio operators in the United States. Um, it typically happens, I think, the weekend before Memorial Day. Okay. Uh, it didn't happen in 2020. I don't think it happened in 2021. Maybe it did, uh, mm -hmm. but Ham Radio Workbench wasn't there. Mm. Uh, I went with the workbench in 2019. You know, it was my only time to Dayton. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never been out there except for that one year in 2019. And uh, I'm a regular on the show now. Back, th back then I was just a guest. Mm -hmm. And now I'm a regular. And George wants to do a badge. 
he wants mm -hmm. to do a batch like this. Yeah. Um, and so we are looking at different microcontrollers. Uh, he wants to do something that does communication between the badges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we're looking I think at... I like I liked that part of the first two badges yeah. a lot. Yeah. That, that there was like interaction between the people who were all getting the badges and stuff yeah. like that. Especially for ham radio, because right, the whole point yeah. of ham radio is to talk to other people, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have we jokingly refer to eyeball QSO. So a QSO um, is a uh, conversation. Okay. So uh, hams use these Q calls or Q codes, mm -hmm. which are shorthand. Mm -hmm. uh, QSL means confirmed confirmation. So you um, uh, uh, like you would send a QSL card. It's like a postcard mm -hmm. that says, I, you know, my call sign is this. I talked to you. Your call sign is this. This was the time and date of the confirmation of the, mm -hmm. of the contact. And yeah. you would exchange QSL cards uh, to confirm the contact. Mm -hmm. and, and people are very proud of their QSL card co collection. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of different Q codes. They they started out in Morse code uh, because it's a lot easier to to pound out on a key QSL than it is to say C O N F I R M E D or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So okay. these shorthand codes, mm -hmm. uh, QSO is an, is shorthand for an exchange. Okay. Okay. So we we had a conversation. We had mm -hmm. an exchange. So an eyeball QSO is we met up mm. in real life. Ah, oh, got it, yep. Because there are these people that you've been talking to on the radio for years. Yeah. You may never have actually met them in real life. Yep, okay. And so there are a lot the of eyeball. Internet. Yep, <laughs> yeah, it's social networking before yep. the internet. Yep. Um, it's absolutely mm. what ham radio was. Yeah. Um, and so we wanted a way to kind of encourage these eyeball QSOs between mm -hmm. um, listeners to the ham radio workbench podcast. Yeah. And so we're gonna, we're not gonna do infrared. We're um, the microcontrollers we're looking at have uh, what's called LoRa, L-O-R-A. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with LoRa? A little bit. Like, I haven't used it, but but I know of it. Um, it's like low, I forget what it actually stands for, it. but yeah. My daughter is texting me. Hold on. <laughs> um, no problem. Anyway, we're going to be using LoRa mm -hmm. uh, trans transceivers. I'm still <laughs> broadcasting <Hi>. with Carrie. <laughs> um, and, and, and. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, cool. Do, 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 do. Um, okay. So, so you're thinking of a ham badge with yeah. that exchanges these contact cards? Yeah, something like, uh, like yeah. yeah. So you can program your badge with yeah. your call sign and uh, maybe some other information about you. And cool. when you go up to somebody and you select them from the list of other radios mm -hmm. that it can hear and you say, I'm going to QSO you or whatever. Yeah. Long range, nice. bit of a tortured abbreviation. Oh, oh is it just long range? I thought I was like, I think it's like long range something or other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. So uh, we haven't worked out exactly what the details are going to be, but we want to mm -hmm. do something that doubles as like an ID badge. So it's going to have yeah. a, um, an OLED display on it, a big mm -hmm. bright OLED display that mm -hmm. you can put your call sign on nice. or your name nice. or whatever. Um, and one that cool. you wear around your neck like a lanyard. Mm -hmm. And then also have this ability, this little communications little thing. Exchange. we got to figure that out. Cool. So that's going to be my next badge. Kind of a cross between badge life and ham radio. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. Any other question? One more question. Yes. So, like you, your your day job has been software for a long time, but obviously yeah. operations, you, system, yes, DevOps. Yeah. Yes, but obviously you have like a quite strong background in hardware as well, right? You're doing. I know you kind of downplay yourself in this aspect, well, but I'm like, I'm like, dude, you're like, making, I know, I know, you're I know. Making audio amplifier PCBs, like you're making all of these other badges that are like quite complicated like don't the, don't downplay yourself so the like, problem is that i know ees pro professional ees right so i i am advanced for a <laughs> hobbyist but i've never done this as a paying gig right so that's mm, yeah we, we can talk a lot about about what qualifies you to fair do enough. different things fair right? enough and and experience is is the majority of i it. have a fair <laughs> bit of experience yes, yes. So, um, so my question though is like, was there one or the other that like came first? Like, did you, so you started doing like these radio shack kits when, you know, you yeah, were when in, like, I was third grade yeah. and stuff like that. So did you kind of, were you also like playing around with programming at that point or did programming like come second or did one like lead into the other? 
Uh, I was doomed to be a nerd from mm -hmm. birth. And why did you kind of choose software as like the professional yeah. thing? So path? my dad worked for IBM mm -hmm. for 32 years. Um, my mom was a network administrator at the local high school. Mm -hmm. My oldest sister is nine years older than me. And she bought our family's first computer when I was three years old. <laughs> so we had yeah. a TRS-80 Model 1 growing up. Oh, I, that's nice. what I had growing up. Um, you know, my dad brought home a PC junior. I think I was probably eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I got into PCs. Right. So I've been around computers literally my entire life. Yeah. And I've been encouraged to program them and use them. I got into BBSing when I was in fifth grade. I mm -hmm. started running my own BBS when I was in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was 12 years old and I was a sysop <laughs> of a BBS. Um at the same time all of that was going on, I was also playing with the 50 and one. Um, and yeah. I was doing uh, a lot of Lego, mm, uh, yeah. a shit ton of <laughs> Lego. Uh, my parents say that they spent a veritable fortune on Legos and it was the best investment they ever made. I, I know a guy who's selling some Lego if you need some Lego. <laughs> I got a Lego hookup, by the way, just, just letting you know. Just saying. Just saying. Um, <laughs> and so I, just saying, I, Kevin's selling some of this Lego, <laughs> if you know. So, uh, and I got into the Technic <laughs> Legos very quickly, right? you know, pretty young. And so there are a lot of motors and, uh, mm, yeah. and um, I made, you know, I got little project boxes from Radio Shack and, mm -hmm. and put in switches in there to make my own controllers. I was building robotic arms. I was nice. doing uh, amusement parks, like all of these large mm -hmm. scale technical mechanical Lego kits with motors and lights that I wanted to control. And so yeah. I was playing with electronics, excuse me, electrics. Like, like there was no active electronics. There was no transistors or. Yeah. or okay. Or, sure. Yeah. Um, from a very young age, mm -hmm. right? Playing with lights and batteries and motors and switches and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff from a very young age, uh, early elementary school. Um, so I don't know that one really came before mm -hmm. the other. Right. Um, I've been doing software, writing things in basic, you know, on the TRS-80 and on the PC junior and, uh, I did a bunch of, I actually wrote my own BBS code for a while, but it sucked. So I ended up going back to <laughs> um, uh, other people's software. I ran Asgard or Citadel, if anyone knows what those are, uh, for many, many, many years. In fact, technically, I still am running it on Unix now. Mm -hmm. But um, but because I've been a sysop, a system operator, since 1987, when I was 12 years old, um, that kind of led into when I got into college and I found Unix mm -hmm. and I found Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a very early adopter of Linux. My mm -hmm. first kernel compile was version 0 0.99, patch level 13G. Um, anyway, I've been doing, yeah. <laughs> Nobody does. It's okay. I've been doing this for a long ass time. Um, and, you know, so, but that's kind of like being a sysop. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that led into systems engineering and network mm -hmm. engineering and uh, running applications. I write code, but I'm not a software developer. Yeah. Right. I can yeah. I write a lot of code for microcontrollers. Mm -hmm. I can do a lot of shell scripting. I do. Uh, historically, I've done Perl. Nowadays, I do Python, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of yeah. thing. But I don't I'm not an application developer. Right. Right. Yeah. I've never done a mobile app. I've never done a big web application or mm -hmm. anything like that. Right. My, my programs typically top out around a thousand lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like right now, my secret squirrel project is probably going to be the biggest uh, single application I've written. Mm -hmm. um, wild guess, probably <laughs> a couple or 3000 lines, maybe, yeah. maybe a little bit more than that. Um, so you say I do software and yeah, I do, but not like huge application yeah. level software, but I've been doing that kind of stuff pretty much my entire life since no. I was a kid. Same with hardware. And, and I started getting into electronics. Uh, like my first couple of years at Cal Poly were as an electrical engineering, mm -hmm. uh, were in EE. Um, and that I, the reason I did EE is because computer engineering, mm -hmm. which is kind of a cross yeah. between computer hardware and computer software. They had computer science, which was all software, yeah. and electrical engineering, which, which was all, all hardware. hardware. 
Yeah. They had computer engineering, but it wasn't accredited yet. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't want a non-accredited degree. Yeah. Um, and so I sense. went to EE because yeah. I, I I figured I could learn the software easier than I could learn, learn the, the, the EE. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then at the end of my second year in college, the computer engineering degree became accredited. Mm. They got their accreditation. And then I transferred from EE into nice. computer engineering. Uh, and so I finished out. Uh, I never had to do power. <laughs> uh, but I did do an awful lot of digital circuits mm -hmm. and microcontroller design and, and or microprocessor design and stuff like that. Cool. Um, so I don't, I think I kind of did both at the same yeah. time. I kind of came up doing both. Uh, and I've always been interested in that crossover, that intersection between the code and the hardware. Yeah. Um, and it was programming is the best kind of programming. Yeah. And I'm uh, not biased at all. And yeah, of course not. No. But even like systems level programming, writing yeah. low level C code on a Unix platform yeah. is still yeah. kind of that. Still like, kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm in the kernel, in yeah. the Linux kernel. I have a patch that I submitted to the Linux kernel back in 2002. If you look me up in the credits mm -hmm. file, uh, I think I was msmith at comdev.cc <laughs> is the email address that's there. But Mark Smith and I committed a patch for the bonding driver. I'm the one who added multicast support to the bonding driver in the Linux kernel because the company I was with, I don't know, nobody does okay. <laughs> The point is that you can, you that, that intersection yeah. between software and hardware applies yeah. to a computer as well, yes. right? Yes. Uh, the people who are yeah. writing the kernel drivers, but that yeah. that's the kind of the place where I like to be. Yeah. Um, don't ever ask me to write a UI. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Uh, you, so, yeah, that web I think programming. That was the, nope. I think that was like a really big learning experience for me when I like made the skein minder was mm -hmm. that I had all of the operational code for like running it and adding the UI was like it took the Holy majority geez. of the like there's more code with just dealing with UI in there than yeah. there is with actually like turning the machine on and off. Yeah. 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 It's, it's very interesting. My yeah. secret squirrel project is going to be the same because yeah. it's it's yeah. going to be UI heavy. It's a it's a mm -hmm. user device. Yep. And so I'm I'm going to try doing my own UI, but I fully expect to have to reach out to somebody for help on that. I'll, I'll see oh, what I can come I up with, but it's going to be, be super fine. functional. You It'll know, functional. That's okay, though. Yeah. Like, if you're making a thing that is functional in nature, it is fine to have a functional UI. Like, yeah. and it is in many cases preferred because you just need it to tell you the shit that you need yeah, yeah. to know to operate this thing, you yeah. know? So yeah, I don't know. There's we'll we'll see. I, I'll, I'm I'm going to take the first stab at it myself. N because... Not a, not everything has to be round and bulbous and beautiful, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. The, the uh, square is cool. Square is cool. Square yeah. is cool. Says says a person who is like whipping out her TI eighty five calculator this morning in a meetup, and we were we were there was some calculator old calculator chat going on. Yeah. yeah. And somebody pulled out a TI eighty five, and I'm like, oh no, wait, I have one too. <laughs> And then somebody pulled it, somebody else pulled out a newer one, and it was like, oh, look how roundy that is. <laughs> I like your your fonts. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Have you told that story fonts. on Solder Sesh yet? Oh your, no, your oh, I haven't really. Font? I haven't really talked about the big fonts. No, we should. We'll do that at a different one. Okay. At a different yeah, one. We're, we're already we're, way, we're over, way over. Way but over. like, thank you guys for I, all coming. That I told you all cool. that getting me to shut up was going to be the hard part. And thank you, Mark, for bringing all of your awesome show and tell. That well, was really fun. Thank you for having me. I, on. I learned a lot. So. I love talking and explaining and, and it's all good stuff. that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Yeah. And instigating. Don't instigating, forget the yes. instigating and enabling. Yes. You're really, enabling you're people really to go off and do awesome yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. That's my goal in life. <laughs> when people come to me and say, Hey, I saw the thing that you did and it inspired me to do whatever, like that is yeah. the best payment of anything. Knowing that I inspired to somebody to do something or I helped explain them, explain to them how to do a thing or to understand a thing that they've been doing without understanding. Yep. Man, that is the best feeling in the world. Yeah. So totally, totally. Well, cool. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Vince. Yes. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Thank you Jeff Brent, and Vince. Everybody else. Who else? It was, it was good. Only those Didn't... people are on the screen. I don't I know. know who else we have. John, John McGrath. Thank oh, John you. McGrath. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I notice a bunch of these names, so, recognize cool. these names and call signs from Twitter. <laughs> Excellent. Woohoo. Cool. All right. 
Well, hopefully I shall see uh, some of you, maybe all of you uh, next week. I don't quite know what we're doing next week yet, so I can't plug it. Bad carry, but you know, follow me on Twitter. I'm um, at AlpenglowIND, A L P E N G L O W I N D. Ooh, there we go. Woo! Robin is on it. You've got a bug. That way. That way. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, and follow Mark because he's always doing super cool stuff at Smitty Halibut. I've got a bug. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Yeah, we're. we're I don't have those. Here. We're pro here. <laughs> you guys are rad. Robin is rad. Robin is rad. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. Okay. Cool. See you all later. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Be good humans. Bye.